I look at your two books and, and I'm literally just paraphrasing from what you said, that they're basically the yin and yang. So you have chaos on one hand and you have order on the other. Both will tend towards tyranny. And as far as I can tell, and this is why I do not understand why people are pushing back on you, why there's so much bizarre backlash, is you, the moral of your story is, hey, everybody, guess what? You, you need to find this balance between the two. If you only exist in the creative potential, it ends up being all chaos all the time. If you only exist in the conservatism, the things that are already there and working, they will tend towards tyranny, solidify and cease to be useful and die. And so now it's this game and you do this brilliant explanation of what happens in a city that shows exactly this with artists. And if you can walk us through that and tell me if, if, the identity of the artist, if that's what you're trying to get at with identity, because I'm understanding what you're saying in terms of, okay, in that moment, we're negotiating, but there's a grander sense of who we become that is seems to me to be a negotiation with the world, so collectively everybody else, but also mm-hmm. a negotiation with how I want to feel about myself when I'm alone and the things that I think are right, the things that yeah. I think are wrong. Okay, well, that, okay. well, that's very complicated, so I'll walk it through. So. As you pointed out, I'm going to hold up these books. So this is the new book, Beyond Order. And it does concentrate on pathologies of structure and the previous book, which is 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. And the the underlying presupposition there is that in our phenomenological landscape, so that's the world as we experience it, complete with emotions and motivations and dreams. And so the full range of human experience including the subjective and the objective, let's say, can broadly be broken into two domains. And one is the domain of things that are beyond our grasp and reach, and that's the unknown. The unknown emerges, when the unknown emerges, you tend to experience anxiety. And then there's the the known, and I define the known very specifically and, and very carefully. The known is the place you are when what you're doing produces the results you want. And I say want because that brings motivation and emotion into the game. So you're motivated to pursue something. You pursue it and what you want happens. Not only do you get what you want, but you get validation for the structure that governs your perceptions and your actions. Now, if you, you know, imagine that you're, um, you know, you're lonely and you approach a young woman in a, in a social situation, um, attempting to make some contact with her, um, you, you want to alleviate your loneliness, and so you hope you make a good impression, and you tell a joke, let's say, in a relatively awkward manner, and you get rebuffed, then you feel you, 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 you're no longer where you control. You're no longer where you exercise control. And that brings up all sorts of specters in, immediately. It's like, well, why were you rebuffed? Well, maybe all women are uh, to be despised. That's one theory. Maybe there's something deeply wrong with you. Maybe you're having an off day. Maybe it wasn't a very good joke. And so when you don't get what you want, then a landscape of questions emerge. And those questions can resonate through different levels of your identity from the trivial, oh, I told the joke wrong, to the profound. There's nothing desirable about me and I'll be alone for the rest of my life. Now, you asked about identity, and I used the example of a child's game, but I could go through an identity. And so I do this particularly in maps of meaning. And so, for example, let's say I'm sitting typing. Okay, we could decompose my identity. So at the highest level of resolution, I'm moving my fingers. And so that could be my identity. I'm the thing that moves its fingers. And then slightly at a slightly broader level than that, I'm typing words. And at a broader level, I'm typing phrases and thinking them up, and then sentences, and then paragraphs, and then chapters, and then, let's say, full papers or books. That, that's, a, that's a productive unit. So I'm the author of a book or the author of a paper. That's an identity. But then that's nested inside, for me, it would be nested inside being a clinical psychologist, being a professor, being a good citizen. And then that's nested in some, inside something that's even broader than that. And I would say that that's nested inside a, a cultural heroism. And I don't mean that specific to me. I mean that for everyone. That's the outermost level, whether you're playing out the role of hero or adversary, say. That's, that's the highest possible level of identity. That's the level at which fundamental morality is adjudicated. 
And there isn't really anything beyond. Outside that is, it's beyond us. It's the transcendent itself. And you're all of those at, at any one time. You're all of those levels of identity. But those are all practical, right? So those are the roles that you're playing in the world. All of those are a consequence of who you are. But in interplay, like in this situation with the child, all of that's negotiated with other people. And so if you have a functional identity, you see, if you have a functional identity, when you act it out in the world, then you get what you want and need. And if an identity doesn't do that, well, then you should, you either retool your identity or you retool the world. Your now, conception speak, of the world? Well, if you're retooling your conception of the world, then you're retooling yourself. No, you can actually... I mean, what a revolutionary does is try to bring the world into alignment so with literally their change theory. The world. Yes, literally. Well, and we all do that to some degree because we are practical engineers, you know. I mean, not only do we perceive the world, but we also interact with it so that it does manifest itself in accordance with our desires. There's limits, obviously, to how far you can go or how far you should go with that. You know, and... um. What are the limits? Well, there's practical limits. Nature won't do what you want it to unless you're very sophisticated in your, in your application of your knowledge and other people will object. So now you might say, well, you should forge forward regardless of their objection. And, you know, there are circumstances under which that's true. But generally speaking, that's not a very good idea. It certainly doesn't make you popular as a child. And so that brings up one other issue. I would also say, and this I developed this idea quite a bit in the new book. You go from egocentrism as a child, you have to go through this period where you're socialized as a child and adolescent. And that really means that you allow your identity to be molded and shaped by the group. And, you know, you think about how important peers, friends and peers are to children and adolescents. You know, your mother will say uh, when you're a teenager, well, if Johnny jumped off the bridge, would you too? And you say, well, no. But the real answer is, well, probably if all your <laughs> friends are there taunting you, you would, in fact, jump off the bridge. And not only that, generally speaking, you should. Because it's your duty, it's your developmental duty as a child and a teenager to take your your isolated self and turn it into a, a functioning social unit. Now, you could say, well, do you, you, Peterson wants everybody to be a functional social unit, a robot, you know, a cog in the wheel. And, and I would say, well, that, that isn't where development stops. It has to go through that period before you can emerge as a, as a genuine individual, which means you have to know the rules of the game before you can break them. But not being able to abide by the rules is not anything like being a genuine creative individual. Those are not the same thing. And there's plenty of attempt to confuse the two things because it's much better if you can't follow the rules to view yourself as a uh, avant-garde revolutionary than as a failure. And it's not like I don't know that that social molding crushes Obviously, it crushes, and everyone feels that. Th these are existential problems. Everyone deals with the tyranny of culture and the fact that it does want you to be a certain way and not other ways, and those ways might not be in keeping with, your, with your, the deepest elements of your nature. Well, tough luck for you, you because you're also the beneficiary of culture, and so you have to offer it your pound of flesh. Now, you shouldn't do that at the expense of your soul. But you shouldn't stay an immature child other, either. Okay, and so, so this this notion of identity that we're being fed is very, very, it's very thin. What are we being fed? Be very specific. Well, well, there is the idea, for example, that your identity is whatever you say it is and that everyone else has to go along with that. No, that isn't how it works, partly because no one even knows how to go along with it. Like, let's say, just for example, that you're uh, gender non-binary. Okay, what am I supposed to do about that? 
man, I don't know, I hardly know what to do if the rules are already there. So let's say I grow up, I want to, being a heterosexual male, I want to find a woman, fall in love with her, raise a family, have children, have grandchildren. That's a game. I know the rules to it. Not well, because everyone's a failure at that. You know, it's very difficult, but at least you kind of know what the, the goal is, and so does the person you're with. Well, you leap out of that, which is already terribly difficult. You leap out of that into completely unknown territory, saying um, uh, that I'm presenting yourself as something other than those categories leaves everyone around you and you completely bereft of direction. Let me put it what in do do? words that I get from um, your material. So what I heard you just say, tell me if I'm wrong, is part of the negotiation that we do from the time we are little kids and figuring out that play, we're up on the bridge, we jump maybe because we want to you know, fit in with our peer group. Um, it There is a sense of order to that. Now, you've been very careful and it would drive me crazy if people respond to this interview as if you have not already illustrated that it is the balance between two opposing forces. But so we need enough order so that somebody can find their way through the world and that many I think a big part of the reason that your work has resonated so profoundly with people is they're, excuse me, they are left in a world where they don't know how to move forward in a way that serves them spiritually, practically as well, for sure. And so, well, hey, everybody. Well, both of those, both of those practically shades into spiritually as you move up into the broader reaches of identity. You know, and look, this, this, See, one of the things, I really laid this out in Maps of Meaning. It took me a long time to understand that belief regulated emotion. So what happens is that if you act out your identity, if you act out your beliefs in the world, and what you want doesn't happen, what happens is that your body defaults into emergency preparation for action. And the reason for that is you've wandered too far away from the campfire. And now you're in the forest and maybe you're naked. And so what do you do then? And the answer is, well, you don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't want know what to do? And the answer is you prepare to do everything. And the problem with that is that it's unbelievably draining psychophysiologically. Like it hurts you. And there, there's, there's an immense physiological literature detailing the, the cost of, of, of exactly that kind of response. And so people need people and animals. They people stay where what they do has the results they want. That's partly why you want to be around people who share your cultural presuppositions, is because you know that, for example, even in small ways, let's say you're a country music aficionado, and you're hanging around with your cowboy hatted buddies, and you throw on a tape, and everyone says great tunes, man, and you you know you're happy about that, but you know. You throw on a piece by Tchaikovsky and you're you're in a different subculture and who the hell are you? And people, will, the people in your group will say, man, who listens to music like that? And like that's a trivial example in some sense, but I, I believe it's one that everyone can resonate to. We like we it's very hard on us not to be where we know what we know that what we want is going to happen. We hate that. We hate that, and no wonder. So, and then, you know, there are, there are varying degrees of that, obviously. You can really be where you don't know what's going to happen, or you can only be there to some degree. But by and large, by and large, we're conservative creatures, even if we're liberal in temperament. There's not, we can't tolerate that much uncertainty. And there, you might ask, well, why? And the answer is, well, because you can be hurt pain, you can be damaged, you can become intolerably anxious, and you can die. So it's no wonder you're sensitive or very sensitive to negative emotion. And so our identities, right, functional identity regulates your emotion. But you do that in concert with other people. In the first chapter of the new book, Beyond Order, the rule is uh, don't casually denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. That's that balance again. Um, I make the case that most of your sanity is socially distributed. And what I mean by that is, well, let's say that you know how to behave. You're well socialized. You can play with others. 
Now, I said already in this conversation, if you didn't learn to play with others between the time you were two and four, you will never learn. And psychologists have beat their heads against the wall trying to rehabilitate antisocial children. They can't do it after the age of four. Is that no, because areas of the brain just don't develop? Well, it seems to be partly because the kids fall farther and farther behind. So let's say you make the leap from egocentric dependence on your mother at two and three to immersion in a peer group. Well, then, the, then you, you pick peers that are at your same developmental level and you chase each other up the developmental ladder. And the longer you're out of that, the farther you fall behind. And so, you know, kids, five-year-old kids might come across another five-year-old kid who tends to cry too much if they don't get their way. And they'll say, we don't want to play with the baby. And what they're saying is, we have to find someone who's at our developmental level, shares our developmental horizon so that we can mutually scaffold our further development. Now, they're not going to say that, obviously, but that's the situation. And kids test each other out when they first meet. So do adults. Game, 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 game. Can you play? Are you playing at the same level as me? I'm playing my game at the level that will further my development. Can you play along with me? If not, well, maybe you're lower in status and I can pull you up as a mentor. Maybe you're higher in status and I can learn from you. But if you're a peer, we can play together. Anyways, if you're acceptable to your peers and you behave well, they'll accept you. And then they tell you all the time if you're acting appropriately. You know, if your jokes are funny, if you're dominating the conversation, if you're bringing something of value to the table, and all you have to do is pay attention to the social cues, and you'll keep yourself regulated. Okay, I want to dive in here, and I'm going to see if I'm tracking all of this, because I'm, I'm putting this in a larger context of this really matters, and it applies directly to something that's happening in the world. It seems to me that you don't dive into things unless they have real relevance. So... Is it fair to define identity as the self-narrative that emerges from a nearly infinite number of interactions with other people and nature itself? Well, I, I would say yes, but that gets to the point. It's so broad, it's almost it, it starts to lack definition. So I can take it finer than that. I, I am trying to sort of find the borders yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Then, then I will work in. Okay, so if, we're, if we still remain true at that point, um, then having in the book, you walk through a lot of some of the people that you've done psychoanalysis with. And so we get a lot of insights into the actual people that you're dealing with and how people can begin to tell themselves a narrative that is very dysfunctional. And you help them out. I don't want to say easily because that, that sounds like it cheapens it, but pretty straightforward in helping them reframe. And framing is something I'm obsessed with. And so mm -hmm. our identity is based on this. It's a self-narrative that we tell ourselves based on the interactions we have with other people and nature, such that we begin to solidify a set of behaviors that make sense for us based on the goals that we want to achieve and where we're trying to go. Am I still good? Yes. Well, you improved your definition by adding the behavior element because I would say the fundamental element of identity is what you act out. On top of that, there's the story that you tell. Do I have to be consciously aware of it? Well, you're consciously aware of some of it, not of other elements of it. You can't be consciously aware of everything you do. And does it, the conscious and conscious alike make up my identity as you define it? Your identity is the story you tell about your actions in the world, but it's also your actions in the world. Okay. Now, it's both why, why does my identity, and I assume as I understand it, why does my identity as I understand it matter to the course of my life? Because it's the, it's the structure of the, it's, it's the structure from which the plans that you implement in the world originates. And you're always acting in the world. You have problems to solve all the time. And you have to solve, you have, you have to solve, there's all sorts of problems you have to solve to stay alive. And you have to solve them for today, but you have to solve them in a way that works for today, that doesn't screw up tomorrow too bad and leaves next week intact and next month and next year. And so there's a continuum of you. So that's another, see, that's the other reason why your identity can't just be you. Because 
or how you feel right now, because you're not only who you are right now and how you feel right now. You're this strange entity that exists right now, but that already existed in the past and that is going to repeat itself into the future. And so you're actually a community of individuals stretched out across time. And the plans that you implement have to be beneficial for that entire community of individuals. And it's going to be the case that there isn't much difference between you acting properly with regards to your extended temporal self and you acting properly in relationship to other people. That's interesting. So you're stuck with society just because you know that there's a future. You're stuck with society, even if you're solipsistic, right? If you think you're the only conscious consciousness that there is, there's still the fact that you have duration across time and that, you know, you have to take into account what, the consequence for your actions is going to be on the 50-year-old Tom and the 80-year-old Tom. People have this innate drive to control the environment, themselves, whatever, but they want to, to be in control. And there, if you aren't able to, in full view of everybody, out-compete, you still have this drive for control and then people go underground. It's the whole theme of the 48 Laws of Power. Correct. That's what I wrote about in the preface to it. Yeah, um, the thing about Nietzsche, because, you know, he's my, he's my idol. He's Really? Ian. Oh, he's Why do people have such a dark books. view of him? I don't know him well enough to understand he's why. He's in all of my books. I was reading him when I was 16, 17 years old. And oftentimes what happens in your life, people that you read when you were that age, and you're now, I'm now in my 60s, I'm sorry to say, Wow. And, and, uh, Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, 46 seems like a kid. Um, you know, things that I read when I was 18, uh, that the, I don't know, I don't like anymore. Mm. Nietzsche is like a through line. I'll never get bored with him. I'll never tire with him. He's just absolutely the greatest. Um, but his will to power is something that got misunderstood. It's, it's like, it, it's not necessarily what you think it is. It's de Macht. And the concept of Macht or power in Nietzsche is, it's control, it's more like expansion. That's what the word really means. And he takes it down to a biological level that every organism wants to expand its circle, wants to expand its environment, wants to have more mobility in the world that it's in, right? So it's a native biological need that all creatures have for expanding themselves for having more influence. So what it means for a human is to have more power and more influence and able to move in greater circles, to have more control. Yes, control is part of it, okay? But people, when they have this sort of negative view of power, damn it, that makes me so angry. It, it triggers all of my buttons. I'm sorry to say, because I, can, I am an emotional creature, I have to admit. Because everything is about power, right? The idea that you don't want power that you say, oh, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm, I'm up all about truth and justice and what's good for humanity. That's a form of power, I'm sorry to say. That's you are what seeking I'm power. Realizing. You are seeking power over other people. You know, some of the most heinous crimes have been committed by people who think they're doing good for others, right? Okay, but you want power, right? And I look at academics who have these very lengthy, very powerful arguments about the world, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about power. They don't want to admit it. They want to admit it's just about ideas. It's just about intellect. It's about, you know, the realm of, of, of exchanging ideas. Bullshit. It's about power. You want this sense of expansion. You want people to love you. You want, you love that feeling that what you're doing is influencing others, that you've hit the right answer. Everything you do, the, everything you breathe in is a desire for power. It's a desire for expansion. Look in the mirror and admit it, and let's get away from the negative connotations that we have with it. Yes, power can be used for bad purposes, but as Malcolm X said, um, you know, absolute power corrupts, but powerlessness corrupts even more. So the feeling that you don't have any power. That's so important. So the feeling that you don't have any power is even more corrupting because it makes you passive aggressive. It turns you into these warriors who think they're doing something and you're not even aware of what you're really after. So 
And that was the whole point of the 48 Laws of Power. It was an inflection moment in our culture, in our history, where I was getting really upset with all of the political correctness and all of the squishy self-help books out there, right? And trying to appeal to our good side and et cetera, et cetera. And things like ambition or power were ugly words. Man, I hated that. I thought it was so hypocritical because my experience in Hollywood, for instance, where I dealt with a lot of film directors and powerful people, is they would project this image of being extremely liberal and for all the good causes, but they were wanted power. They really wanted power. And they would often treat people in a poor fashion despite being for all the great causes. And the hypocrisy just really rankled me and that's sort of why I wrote the 48 Laws of Power, to expose that. But I want people to admit, if you were saying look at yourself, that you have this desire for power. It can twist you, you can, you can look for it in wrong ways, most definitely. But at least come to Jesus, come to Muhammad and admit that that's who you are, that that's what's motivating you in your behavior. And from there we can start seeing, well, maybe there are more constructive forms of power that I can go after. Mm. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the Mindset and Business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. It's so interesting because when I was maybe 25, something like that, 26 maybe, I bought the domain Seeking Power. Oh. And I... It was 20 years ago. Yeah, very long time ago. So it was a couple years after my book came out, but I'm not saying there was any Unfortunately, I had not read it yet. I so wish I, I had. You would have saved me a lot of suffering. <laughs> but... Um, I, that felt true to who I was. I was like, I come seeking power. And it was, it felt so light and so expansive and so positive. So it's weird to me that the word power has taken on like these dark, evil connotations. But I was like, I wanna get better. I wanna get more powerful. And my whole youth, I had felt so weak and getting into business, I had finally encountered the idea that you could get better than other people. You could outperform them. And in outperforming them, you could transform your life and you could do things that other people couldn't do. I wish, unfortunately, Kobe Bryant didn't exist back then in any way that I was aware of anyway. Uh, and he has this whole idea of booze don't block dunks. And that you can get <laughs> so good at something that no matter how much people hate you, want to stop you, whatever, you can outplay them sure. and you can still dunk over them. And I was like, oh my God, like this is so amazing. So all I have to do is get good at things. Now to your point, if you're using that for evil, I've got no time for that. But in your own life, if it's, you know, whether in business, if you don't acknowledge that it's a competition, you're gonna get eaten alive. So recognizing, oh, okay, like this is a competition. I'm not out to hurt other people, but I'm absolutely out to outperform them. And life became way more fun when I realized, oh, I can come seeking power. I can sit at somebody's feet and learn from them and want to grow more powerful. And that's why like this whole moment that we're living through now feels like the wrong way to go about the change that people want to see in the world. Because it's like, if you own, okay, I, I want this outcome, and to get that outcome, I need to garner a set of skills, I need to get better at my performance, and then I can do it. When it's out in the open and you're taking personal responsibility, in fact, here's the, the easiest way to sum it up. As Gary Vee says, there are two ways to build the tallest building in town. You can knock everybody else's building down, or you can build a building that's taller than theirs. That's great. Yeah. And if you're spending time knocking people's buildings down, which is the energy I feel coming off of a lot of people, that's not interesting to me. And people do it in the name of, oh, no, 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 like they were just, their building violated some invisible code. You know where that comes from? It comes from envy. I am envy is surprised. a huge mo uh, motive, motivator of people's behavior now. So the drive to bring other people down is, is really truly motivated by feelings of envy, inferiority that other people are better than you are. So it's, it's a, a leveling process that's going down where we want to bring everybody down to the same level. Nobody is excellent. 
nobody's accomplished anything or they just accomplished great things because they had money or because their parents sent them to Yale or Dartmouth or because you know they had all of this privilege you know we're all you know so it's like bringing everyone down but I think that it's envy is 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 the root cause of it so going back to the where we started that people are bored they feel like they're wasting their life but you were saying you know, wherever you go, there you are, that this is an internal problem, you have to master your emotions. How do you begin to tie all that together for somebody that wants out of that, they want to love their life and feel like they're making the most of it. You talked about like, we actually have the ability to get a drug-like effect by looking inward and, and what is it? And improving ourselves and just falling in love being honest about what we actually like and pursuing it like is is that an act of the will to expansion what what's driving that well um, you know there are many ways to look at that it's um, but in mastery I, I my way of describing it is a very high form of fulfillment because I like to think of fulfillment over happiness happiness seems like a kind of an immediate thing where you know, getting some kind of stimulation or drinking whiskey will make you happy, but it won't make you fulfilled. Fulfilling, fulfillment is a longer lasting emotion. Mm. It comes from, wow, I spent two years doing that. I made what I uh, went out to set out to create. I feel fulfilled. It's a wonderful feeling. It's the greatest high in the world, I think. Okay, so my one avenue to get towards what you're saying is through your work. I'm not saying it's everything because I understand relationships and people and children, all these things are very important, okay? But I'm looking at through your work to reach a level of feeling of that sense of power and expansion and fulfilled. And when you have that feeling, you don't want to hurt other people. You don't, there's no need for it. There's no need to push people around for no reason. You feel comfortable with yourself. All right. So the number one thing, the most important thing is to figure out the path towards that kind of fulfillment through your work or through your career. Right. Now, some people don't like that. I've been criticized before I went once and gave a talk at Stanford and they were thinking that that was just so elitist, like fulfillment. Well, through your work, like this one woman said, my father was a truck driver his whole life. Are you saying that he wasn't fulfilled? You know, that kind of criticism. What did you say to that? I said, well, that's actually very elitist on your part. You're saying that that's all your father was ever um, capable of achieving. Maybe, you know, if he was happy being a truck driver, if that excited him, if that's what he was destined to create, if he felt comfortable with that, fine, I have no problem. But a lot of people in very working class jobs aren't necessarily so happy. Their lives are full of routine. There's no kind of intellectual challenge to it. And if you know anything about the human animal and the human brain, we're voracious. our brains are voracious. We need constant stimulation. So if you're driving a truck all day, if that's all you have. If that's fulfilling for you, maybe, yes, being a good driver and getting there on time and delivering goods, maybe that is a road to fulfillment. But maybe your father was frustrated Maybe he was drinking or something. Maybe it didn't really fulfill him. So how can you say that people just should just settle for what they have, right? Because a lot of people aren't happy and they may think they're happy. They may kind of, they may kind of deceive themselves, but deep down inside they're frustrated. And that's why they turn to having affairs. That's why they turn to alcohol. That's why they turn to drugs. That's why they turn to addictions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are all kinds of signs of that. So I'm not necessarily assuming that your father was fulfilled by his truck driving. I could be, that's how I answered her. She wasn't happy with that. Okay, anyway, um, so some people criticize this notion of work, but no, we are animals that love to make things. Somebody wants to find us as homo faber, the animal that likes to build things, to make things. That's our hands. We became powerful through making tools, etc. Also by being social animals, don't get me wrong. But we're creatures that are designed to make things, to build things, to create, right? And I don't, I'm not an elitist. I think every human being on the planet has that desire, right? They want that fulfillment. And I don't care if they're born poor, 
and they're impoverished or they're homeless, they still have that need and they have that capacity to become a master in what they do. So the most important thing in life is to figure out what is your path, what is the kind of work that will bring you that sense of fulfillment, okay? So some people, it's being an entrepreneur, it's being in business. Other people, it's the arts or it's entertainment of some sort. Other people, it's writing, it's words, it's literature. Other people, it's the body, it's sports, it's dance, it's whatever. I don't care. I don't have a hierarchy. I don't say writing books is better than building wood things, wooden things with your hands. It's all the same to me, right? It's all a form of a skill that all can lead to mastery. But you have to find out what that is, and then you have to build towards it. And when you reach that point, let's just look at the end point. So in your 20s, which is the most important part of your life, I think. We, really? Yeah. I don't want to derail, but okay, we should come back to that. <laughs> It's where you're discovering yourself. It's where all the seeds are planted for what's going to happen to you. Of course, they're planted in your earliest years. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that's the most critical phase, hmm. right? You're exploring, you're trying things out. You're experimenting with different uh, careers, etc. You're gaining skills because you're learning. You, like you said, you wanted to learn, right? And then you're 32, 33, and you start a podcast, a website, your own business, etc. And maybe it fails, but you're excited it's your own. And then you learn from it, and then you create something even better. Man, it's like the greatest feeling in the world. You don't need anything else. You know, you've accomplished something. You set a goal and you reached it. It is, to me, a feeling of high. So when I write a book, it's painful. There's a lot of pain involved, stress, et cetera, et cetera. But man, there's nothing in the world I would give up I even had a stroke probably because of that. I wouldn't give up any of that for that sense of, I could look back, I wrote that book. Mm. I can die tomorrow and I'm happy. I did what I thought I needed to do. I reached not all of my potential, but a good portion of my potential. To me, that is, if everybody had that open to them, then I think we would live in a much better world if we live, if people knew that as a value and went towards it. And I think the greatest periods in history, the kind of the golden eras, we can look at Athens, we can look at Renaissance Italy, we could look at the 1920s in America, the jazz era and all the great cultural movements. Pick your whatever period you like. Some people like the 60s, some people hate the 60s. I don't care. Whatever you think is a golden era. They're era of richness, of diversity, of all kinds of creative people doing all kinds of interesting things. It's an openness and everyone is experimenting. And that this kind of change that's brewing and experimentation, that's to me is a high point of human culture. And it comes from more and more individuals doing, taking this path that I'm talking about. Do you have a math equation for lack of a better word for fulfillment? How would that be? A plus B. Times yeah, kind y. of. So here, I think that. So I agree with you so violently. I want to bite through the table. Uh, <laughs> Go <and> ahead. <laughs> so I uh, might not be the, the best use of my teeth. Uh, so I have a rough formula of what I think leads to fulfillment. And I think about this a lot. So I'm always looking for somebody that can help me refine. But I think it goes like this: It has to be hard, and there's reasons for this from an evolutionary standpoint. But it has to be hard. It has to be something that you get more energy from than it takes. So it's something that you inherently enjoy. And it has to be something that allows you to transform your potential into skill set. And that skill set has to be something that serves you and the group. If you do all of that, you will be fulfilled. If any one of those pieces are missing, it's really hard, it's something you love, you're improving your skill set, but it only serves you, you won't be fulfilled. If all of it, but it only serves the group and not you, you won't be fulfilled. It, it seems to me that it has to have all of those elements. Yeah, I mean, I think there are people, unfortunately, who get that fulfillment without the group part. Do you? Do you think they're actually fulfilled? Yeah, I mean, um, if you like artists who write, who do some kind of great art, but they're not necessarily the best people in the world. You know, oh, it might be a total dick, but... If there are, which I think is its own punishment, P.S., 
but they may find fulfillment in their art if they get feedback from the group, the group is moved, it's sublime, you know, and so their art creates the desired feeling in that person, they have contributed to the group in my estimation. But if that same artist made art and nobody gave a shit about it, I don't think they would feel fulfilled. Well, you know, I don't want to split hairs with you because you're largely correct, but I do, I can't think of examples of people who were ignored in their lifetime and it was painful, but they knew they were right. They knew they had created something brilliant. They knew they had created some invention and it was ignored and nobody cared and nobody liked them. And think it about was painful. Tesla, Nikola Tesla. Yeah, he was pretty miserable. Yeah. So despite doing but, all this incredible shit, being out of step with your time is rough. You are the shout and the echo. So yeah. even though when Einstein was asked, what's it like to be the most brilliant man alive? He said, I don't know. You'll have to ask Nikola Tesla. Despite that, Tesla died very unhappy by all accounts. I obviously did not know him. Certainly alone and broke. And so there was something was missing. He could never get, I'm, I am definitely psychoanalyzing somebody I have no right to, but I have a gut instinct that because he could not figure out the echo part of doing something in a way where people reflected back that, yes, this is amazingly valuable, that even though now we all reap the benefits, was very little consolation. I know, I, I can't think of it because my mind is slowing down, but I was talking recently uh, with my wife about artists and composers, etc., who had no success in life. She's going, really? Said, yeah, never sold any books, their music was ignored. But my research of them, they, they had, just in the work itself, in the absorption of the mind, in composing this brilliant thing, or in writing this thing, they had that flow. Yes, so the pain is definitely there. I'm not arguing against you, because they said... Oh, you might be hairs. right. I mean, I'm utterly fascinated. Splitting hairs, but the, the thing is, is the sense of flow. Because what happens is, what makes you miserable is your self-absorption in, in, in many ways right? The worst form of therapy is to sit there and talk about your problems. The best form of therapy is to get outside of yourself. Brother, people are going to be like, the record just skipped for a lot of people. Go back. The worst form of therapy is talk therapy? What? what? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, maybe not the worst, but it's not to me the most productive therapy to just talk about your problems. Really? Why? Because it's like, it's like accentuating your self-absorption right? Whereas what you need is to get outside of yourself, not into all of your, your problems. Now, of course, I, I'm contradicting myself because I talked about introspection. That's a different thing. We're not introspecting about my problems, what my parents did to me, more and more, oh, I'm so miserable, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure there are forms of talking therapy that are good, so I shouldn't generalize that. But what I think... I don't know, something feels intuitively right about this. Yeah, well, I just wrote... Sorry, I keep doing that about um, this man, people won't have heard of him, he's, he's a, a Russian mystic, whatever you want to call him, Gurdjieff, who had these exercises. I've heard the name, but I don't know. Um, and one thing he taught his students was to not vent your unpleasant emotions. So he had this exercise called self-observation, where you to go observe yourself like you did in the most deepest way, not just your thoughts, but about your body and how your body and your mind interact in this insane continual blend. There's no separation. So one kind of thought will affect your body, but a feeling in your gut will affect your thinking. You're all this, observe yourself, observe yourself, observe yourself. And he said, you will discover in observing yourself that most of your thoughts revolve around unpleasant emotions. It's a very bad thing to realize, but it's true. I use the number 95%, but I, I, as I said, I'm pulling it out of you know what again. Um, okay, so most of it is dealing with frustration, resentment, anger, bitterness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and he said, look at those emotions, see them, do not judge them, do not say they're bad or good or whatever, and don't ever talk about them. Don't vent them to people. You can look at them, but don't talk about them. And the people who experience it go, whoa, by not talking about them, they start to, well, they start to go away. I didn't really feel them because I never expressed them. So expressing them was kind of what makes them stronger and more embedded inside of you. I feel right? like we're doing that culturally right now. Yes, most definitely. 
I mean, look, what is the crux of the problem in people today, if I had to summarize it? Oh, and I don't mean people, I include myself in them, us, because I'm a human being as well, as far as I know. I've heard. It's yeah. that we're self-absorbed, right? I think that's the root cause of so many of our issues, right? Because we are creatures that are actually built for empathy, for actually putting our minds into other things, into people, into animals, into solving problems, into our work. That's who we are. And we've turned that around where we're, all of that voracious brain energy that we have, as I said, I just wrote a chapter on the brain, and it's this insanely powerful instrument that is so complex. People say it's the most complex piece of matter in the universe, mm -hmm. right? It's so powerful. And when you turn it inward, it just eats us alive inside. It's like a bacteria eating us from within, as opposed to exteriorizing it into work, into creating things, into building things, into empathy, into working with other people. And if we're getting all ranty and outraged about justice, etc., etc., what you really need to do is to get outside of that and out and helping other people, genuinely helping them, right? If your cause is, and it's my cause as well as the environment, which I believe a lot, which is where my charity goes to, then ranting and complaining online and making people feel bad is useless. Go out and start a movement, create something, do something. You'll feel so much better about yourself and you'll be contributing it. But what we don't need is more of that self-absorption. It's like a centrif centripetal force that's drawing us further and further and further in. My problems, my parents, my education, my brother and sister, my wife, oh, well, 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 well. more and more inward, more problems. It gets deeper, deeper, more irascinated inside of ourselves, right? You want to get out of yourself. So yeah. memento mori is, is this idea. It just means remember death or remember your immortality. And I think it's probably, it's, it's not only one of the most powerful themes in all of ancient philosophy, specifically Stoicism, but in basically all of ancient art as well. Like the most beautiful painting, painters used to paint pictures of skulls and dancing skeletons and, and or, or decaying bodies. And, and, and so this imagery of the, de the inevitable decay, the entropy of life is this timeless theme that basically goes all the way up to modern art. And then it's just like weird ass shapes and stuff. <laughs> we like, so we stopped using art as a tool to remind us of human primal things and started using it as a status symbol you know what i mean and and so what the stoics are so much of meditations and uh and and seneca's writing is is just talking about how easy it is to rem to forget that you'll die or to have the wrong attitude about die like death one of my favorite things from seneca he goes like do not think that you're moving towards death he was like every second that passes is death so don't think about it as like, oh, I'm dying in the future and I should be prepared for that. Think about the fact that we're dying every day, um, that you're just... Why is that better? It, it's just a reminder. It's not like death is this thing in the future, so I'm going to dick around today. It's right. that like the that hour that I spent forever. on the couch, I died one hour of my death. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the, his point is that so many people think that there's life and death, but there are ways of living that are essentially a form of being dead. Mm. And that this is in fact how most people die, uh, or most people live. Uh, there's this um, sort of haunting, messed up uh, story in Seneca. One of the emperors is sort of like walking down this row of, of you know, condemned prisoners and the prisoner is pleading for his life, please don't kill me. And the emperor looks at him and he thinks, and he's like, you think you're alive, you know, because this man's horrible way of living was already death, you know? And, and so that just, I think it so resonates with people um, because it's so the opposite of, of, of how modern life is set up. Uh, people die in hospitals far from mm -hmm. our house. Uh, who spends time with old people? We are so segregated even by age, right? Um, there's been so many medical advancements that death doesn't feel random. It feels like it's something your fault. That, like if you eat healthy and you're a good person, obviously you'll live a long time. And on average you will, but that doesn't mean that uh, non-smokers don't get lung cancer mm -hmm. all the fucking time and you can't be one of those people. That doesn't mean that people uh, don't get hit with tree branches, you know, and die or 
uh, that doesn't mean that countries don't go to war for no reason and lots of people, you know, mm -hmm. like life is tragic and it always has been for all of human history. And so that's, that's definitely, I think, the most powerful one. And it's something I, I mean, I keep on my desk. I mean, so I wear this ring. It's like a reminder, but I have, uh, I bought it on, 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 uh, online. It's, uh, a chunk of a tombstone. And it just like from some, I don't know how this came to be. I, I hope nobody stole it, but it's from like an old Victorian grave. So a couple oh. hundred years old. And it just, uh, it, it just has the word dad on it. And it, so that's so fucking interesting. Yeah. Like I want to start asking people, what is some weird shit that they have yeah. that that is so interesting, especially knowing your views on death and being a dad recently. Yeah. And, and so it's like, look, crazy. I'm, this guy was a father. Did you seek out the word dad? I was looking for something like that. And when I found it and I was like, that's, that's it. That's the reminder that I want to have all the time. Fuck. That one really hit me. I'm not sure why. Yeah. The, the word dad, that it's an actual tombstone. Because it's a, father, because you, what you're thinking about is what that person meant to yes, other people. Yes. Yes. And, and that this is something clearly people identify. He, he, that was part of his identity and he's not here. And not only is he not here, I don't even fucking know his name. Right. Nobody does. Not only does nobody know his name, but at some point after his death, even the ground he was buried in, like suffered an earthquake or right. <laughs> somebody stole it. Like, so it's just, there's a humility in that. And I think a reminder to be present, right? Like, um, so when my, let's say I'm working at my desk and I'm writing and my son is almost three, he comes running and he's like, dad, dad, look at this. <laughs> you know, it, that's like a, I'm going to get this writing done because I'm important or it's important to me, but I am not going to ignore this thing. Mm. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not saying I'm going to quit my work and not focus on it at all, but I am not going to ignore this moment to be this thing that's important to me. Do you know what I mean? I do. I think that gets, uh, uh, I, I want to derail <laughs> yeah. on that, but first I want to address like the the notion of death memento do yeah. not let me forget okay. to come back to your son coming okay. in because yeah. that, that's actually yeah. really fucking and we've interesting talked about but that before yeah, yeah. but i, I want to talk about um so i i have an evolving sense of what my relationship to death should be so for a very long time um it was patently obvious to me that i was going to die but yeah. that we're living in a period where it is conceivable that we'll be able to hit escape velocity from a health perspective and that by the time we're 80, 90, if we're able to live that long, that they can add a year and a day to every yeah. year that we live or yeah. whatever. So or you just live a lot longer than humans have conceived of life as being. Correct. So I thought, okay, that's interesting to me because um, I want to live my life in such a way where my limited amount of time does not impact the size of my dreams. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a denial of death. It was just kind of a cool escape valve for me to, even as I got older, to continue to have big dreams that, you know, sort of by any stretch of the imagination would probably go on beyond me. But because tomorrow was never guaranteed anyway, even yeah. when I was 16, yeah. that there's only that the the sort of false or maybe a better way to think of it is um, from a, an actuarial table standpoint, you're probably going to live long enough for you to have that 40 year dream or yeah. that six year dream or whatever. So because of that, you just, you do, you have yeah. these long ranging dreams. And I felt like because I had long ranging dreams, I was able to do some pretty extraordinary of things, course, but only because I was thinking so long-term. So, okay, as I get older, I don't want to stop having these long-term dreams. Yeah. So I really allowed myself to soak in the notion of, hey, you might live forever. So keep having these big long range yeah. dreams. Now, hearing enough people talk about momentum mori or whatever, I started thinking, all right, people that I really respect are telling me that I need to really think closely about the notion of dying. Yeah. So I thought, okay, let me really stop and inspect how that would impact me. What does that change in terms of the way that I live or um, how I perceive life or whatever? And so far, I will say, because I'm already like, it is it is at the absolute core of my being to only do things that matter, to love deeply, to connect to the people that I love, to not waste time, all that. Like I don't, yeah. I personally don't need that reminder. Yeah. Many people do and, and it's very useful sure. for that. That isn't the reminder that I need. I find that it's actually, it, it feels important to acknowledge the inevitability currently of my death. But at the same time, I find that now I have to fight harder to have long range 
plans. And I don't like the way that feels. So I, it, it is, it's, it's seemingly there's a contradiction between being present and doing or planning big things, but I'm not sure that there is. I don't know exactly how to solve for it, but let's look at the evidence, right? Marcus Aurelius. Here's a guy, he's reminding himself of how ephemeral the emperors who came before him were. He's reminding himself of the inevitability of death. Uh, he's saying over and over again the importance of being present, not being driven by anger. We can't say like that it that this guy didn't accomplish incredible things, right? Like that he that because of that, he just stayed in bed all day. I think what he's saying is like, let's do the right thing for the right reason. You look at Seneca, same thing, talking over and over again about the death, about the, import, uh, the, the inevitability of death, the meaninglessness of uh, posthumous fame, etc. And yet still sits down and writes these essays that continue to be read by millions of people 2,000 plus years after his death. I think what it's about is about stripping out the, the low-grade anxiety or denial or whatever we have and, and being able to focus everything in that, that moment. So when, when Seneca is saying, like, you will die, today could be the last day of your life, he's not saying, quit what you're doing and go have an orgy or go shoot up heroin just to see what it's like. He's saying, live today like a complete day. So, like, what as I worked on Stillness is the Key, it was something I was thinking about a lot. I was like, okay. I could die before this book gets published. What happens to me? It, does someone finish it? Does it get published? Whatever. Does it sit in a drawer? None of that's really my concern. What? Nor is it in my control, right? Even if I write in a will, exactly. Let, Nabokov, I, I think, wrote very clearly, like, destroy my manuscripts after my death. Really? Yeah. And, and lots of authors have done this. And nobody listened. You know, <laughs> Kafka, same thing. We only know about these works because they're... They, they would be upset that we know who they are. Right. So what do I control? What I do control is, did I do everything I could today, right? Did I leave, like, is the book complete as of today? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it as complete up until the point I was able to complete it? Mm -hmm. So I go, you know, the first two thirds are the book that it could be as of today. That's what I do. Does that make sense? It does, but I don't know that it hits me emotionally. So sure. um, let's try to unpack that a little bit. So if you're saying like, hey, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to be present, which we actually didn't address and I don't think is a self-evident realization when one thinks about their death, uh, which would be interesting to hear your thoughts around why that is your association. Um, I I begin to, to think about um, so if I were writing a book, first of all, I'm such a process writer that I would be the, the type that's like, bury the fucking manuscript. Yeah, like, don't yeah, ever let it out. Yeah. People would have no, like they yeah. just wouldn't believe how scandalously bad my early drafts of sure. anything are. Um, so I, I wouldn't think of it in any other way than the following. Did I sincerely pursue making this great today? Yes or no? That's what that, I totally agree with. That's what it's about. He's, okay. he's saying like live every day as a complete day. And then when you wake up tomorrow, you're grateful because you get a second day. It's like you don't walk up to the plate and swing at those pitches and go, oh, I'll get it next time. You go like, this is this is game seven. <laughs> you know, you know this so is fucking interesting. So uh, I so I I still struggle with anxiety, but my anxiety used to be debilitating. Yeah. And one of the things that got me out of that was to say there's no such thing as performance. There's only practice. Yeah. So literally the exact opposite of what you're saying right now, there is no game seven. Even if it was game seven, I would have to tell myself, Hey, this is just practice. And if you fuck this up, no worries. You're going to learn something from this. Here, here's, I think that this is like a life changing assumption that I came to about philosophy. Um, I'm not, I don't sure, not sure exactly where I came to it, but it, it cracked open a whole thing for me. Um, and maybe it was in the 48 laws of power. People go like, but the laws contradict each other. Different situations call for different perspectives, right? right? They're not, so life is fucking complicated. Oh life is a paradox, right? And so I think what you, you go is like, sometimes you need to be told, uh, this moment is game seven. And sometimes you go, it's not even, uh, none of this even matters. You, you go back and forth, right? This is so important, yes. And, 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 so when, and, and also let's think about what philosophy actually is. Because now we have these pretentious academics who are like, this is the theory of the universe. You know What, what Epictetus or Seneca or Marx Aurelius is doing is 
answering questions in the way that like, if I looked at all the Q and A's you've done, I'd be like, Tom, half your answers contradict <laughs> each other. That's because you're talking to Steve and over here you're talking to Susan. And, and then maybe if you were talking to Susan three weeks later, you give a totally different answer because it was a different question or because she's changed, right? Like different things required. So if you're curing anxiety, how can we zoom out and get a different perspective? If you're wasting time or you're, if like, if you're dwelling in the past, then we want to do that. You just do it differently to get the different perspectives that give you the tools to be able to move forward. And ultimately what, and I'm not trying to do this to plug my book. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is get to a place of stillness and clarity and focus so we can be a hundred percent locked in, in whatever we're doing. Mm. So, um, that's what this is all about. And, and sometimes you're flashing forward. Sometimes you're looking to history for perspective sometimes you're emptying your mind entirely it's it's just like every situation's got different handles and you you grab onto the right one at the right time so wow you just put words to something that i think is so incredibly important and are you able to define perspective because to me this is so the book that i'm writing is essentially about how to craft I, and i don't like the word perspective even though it's probably the closest thing okay but the ability to craft a perspective, the ability to at will change your mm -hmm. perspective is critically important. And I think that perspective is the very thing that holds people back. Um, my realization that the people in the inner cities that were working for me at Quest, that they had a bad perspective that was going to blunt their ability to have uh, an extraordinary life. Yeah. That realization is why impact theory exists. So yeah. like that whole notion of perspective being this incredibly meaningful thing um, is, is at the center of my philosophy and my drive and all that. Are you able to define what a perspective is? Um, there's a German word, uh, umwelt, and it basically means like a dog has a different umwelt than a human. And I would argue that a, a champion at this sport versus a, you know, a, a, an egotistical loser who won't get off their couch, they have different umwelts, they have different experiences of reality and the ability to control that or to... To, it's like, you know, you're cranking the thing on the binoculars. Uh, mm. th that's what you want to be able to cultivate. And when you look at what uh, the Stoics are doing, it's sometimes they're zooming way in and going like, just look at the thing immediately in front of you. Don't extrapolate out to the whole. That's what's intimidating you. And then other times they're like, look at the world from above and how puny even the Roman Empire is mm. compared to other things. And they're in some cases in the same same moment doing both of those. And it's just like, it's just realizing that um, how we look at the world is, the, the world is objective, but how we look at it determines what we're going to be able to do to it. Epictetus says, it's not things that upset us, it's our opinions about things, right? And so realizing like, oh, okay, the world is objective. My opinion is what determines everything. Mm -hmm. And by opinion, he means judgments, right? The other, he says, it's not things that upset us, it's our judgment about things. So it's really judge, maybe judgment's a better word than perspective. Uh, well, let's go back to the notion of, so I've heard it pronounced umwelt. I don't know which is I've, right, I'm umwelt, sorry. umwelt, whatever. Yeah. Um, so to define at least, and I don't know if this is the official Miriam Webster definition, yeah. but um, a big part of the need to define an umwelt or, or to have a word for it is um, take uh, birds or fish, right? They, they actually perceive data from the world differently. So sure. a shark can detect electrical signals and you can actually fool a shark into thinking that a metal plate is a flopping fish because you just have the plate emanate an electrical sure. signal sure, sure. and it, it can't help but interpret it that way. But we would not notice anything so we don't know that idea. but like isn't it interesting that we just assume sharks are looking and smelling right that's how we exactly. looking smelling and hearing we just go everyone must be perceiving those senses it's not we don't even we can't even think about how a bat perceives reality driven by radar right yes 100 yeah. percent. and so um i think something that drives my very understanding of the world all of my philosophies everything that i teach is all about we are humans experiencing life through a biological system and that biological system has its own umwelt it yeah. has limitations we see only a certain spectrum of light we hear only a certain spectrum of sound like yes. we can't experience wi-fi signals like there yeah there or maybe we do but on a cellular level and so we have no conscious awareness sure. of it so it's like really getting down to okay 
if you know that your Umfeld is limited and you know that you're confined in this world and that your brain actually has a region of it that says not just what is happening, but how you feel about what is happening, the deep limbic system, right? Your yeah. brain actually processes things through the lens of, is this good or bad, right? That, yes. that you can knock out that part of the brain and cause people massive problems because it yeah once they don't have an emotion about it they can't even decide what they want for lunch sure, Fucking sure. crazy so wrapping your head around okay i i am this i love the notion of the elephant and the writer yeah okay so who is the writer i'm not even going to talk about yeah. that right now i'm just going to say you're a writer your elephant is the biological system and once you understand what motivates that elephant to move to rage to run to hunger sex sleep whatever then you can begin to control it more effortlessly and whether that's to pursue stillness yeah. and um or whether that is just understanding your own motivations and desires i think is incredibly important where i get freaked out is that people have no sense of the elephant. They have no sense that the elephant is controlled by its umwelt. They have no sense that like, okay, you you do have a limited number of inputs coming in in a limited number of ways, but even within that, there's so much degree of like interpretation that you can take control of, that you can begin to decide how you see your world. And once you decide how you're gonna see the world, it will hardwire over time if you obsessively focus on that, so that you get a neurochemical response Humans move away from pain. They move towards pleasure. So now you're changing what gives you pleasure. You're mm -hmm. choosing or changing what gives you pain. And so you're able to steer the elephant. You made a face that says you're not sure you believe that. No, no, no. I'm just thinking, yes. Okay. So yeah. that to me, like once you understand that, then it's like, okay, you can begin to control wrong word you can begin to navigate more intelligently your way through life because you have some end goal yes you begin to hardwire pleasure and pain in a way that is going to move you towards that now i don't sure. think you have complete freedom over what you can hardwire right but there's going back to that 50 50 there's a massive amount that you can sure. manipulate in that to go in a direction that makes sense based on your goals yeah no i totally agree and look i, I think an interesting thing you realize uh when you have kids is you go like Oh, this kid is acting this way because he's really tired, mm. and that it that how he's acting in this situation is not a reflection of him. It's a reflection of environmental habit, things like that. Like we didn't give, he didn't go down for his nap. That's why he's yelling. Uh, he's upset. He says that it's because he wants his toy. Really, he wants to eat, but he doesn't <laughs> know that that's what he wants. And then having the humility to go like we're all. Not only are we all basically just big children, but most of us have an inner child inside of us that, you know, is responding to some childhood trauma that we have that, that is motivating and steering a lot. Of, like you're attracted to this person because they remind you of this other person or you repeat this pattern where you end up frustrated or upset or, you know, um, in pain because that's a trauma that, that's familiar to you and you're just enacting. And so realizing that we're sort of pulled by these forces uh, lets you, I think, or hopefully go, oh, I'm not mad. I'm tired. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. or, or go, this is, I think this is what would make the world a better place. Go, this person who I don't know, who's rude to me in the supermarket is not a bad person. They're just responding to one of these forces, right? And this also, I think, allows us to be more forgiving of people who are in jail, people who have failed, people who are not successful. You go, oh, all these things are contributing, but you have the ability, just like a, you can bring a shelter dog. We go, oh, you can't turn, a, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't teach your old dog new tricks. <laughs> but if you got a dog from a shelter, you could teach it to sit very quickly. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's like fresh for both of you. And the environment has changed and the situation has changed. And, and that like, it's just silly to write other people off or to write yourself off or uh, to do, what do they call it? The attribution fallacy where, where we attribute because of one piece of behavior or one flash observance, we attribute uh, an entire understanding about who that person is or what they're capable of because we saw them yell at someone or we saw them be nice to someone and we don't realize that actually they're a serial killer. Do you know what right. I mean? Like it's, it's all very complicated. That escalated quickly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I want to go back to what you just said. That's super interesting. You, and I think this is very true. 
the problem isn't that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The problem is you can't teach your old dog new tricks. And I assume in that analogy, you're saying like, it might be hard for you to change your own mind, but if you could step outside or have somebody come in from the outside, you could even be very easily retrained maybe. Yeah, I think so. And that's why, word, but. that's why when people undergo a trauma or they find out they have cancer or they move to a new city, suddenly a whole bunch of things that weren't possible before become possible. Or I think this also explains why momentum uh, is so valuable because mm. it's changing. Suddenly you think you're capable of something that you're no more or less capable of before, but now you've earned a little confidence or you see yourself differently and then suddenly everything changes. That's really interesting. Uh, go down that path. Cause I think that, um, what you're calling momentum, what I think most people would refer to in that scenario is confidence yeah. is one of the most important things for people in business, probably in life, but I always think about it in the business context for them to be able to create that momentum. One, how do you create that momentum? Why does it matter so much? Well, so I just hear from lots of people who want to write books, right? There'll be someone they're like, Hey, I'm, you know, a super successful CEO of X, or, you know, I've done this for like, I've been a professional athlete the last, the next 10 years, the last 10 years. And I want to become, you know, a motivational speaker or something. And they go like, help me make a book. And I go like, why are you starting with the hardest <laughs> thing? Like, write one tweet, you know, or one <laughs> article, like, you know what I mean? Do one, like it, the idea that you should just for flat, fast forward all the way to the end without building the process to get there. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's what momentum is. Uh, that, that that's the, the, what you will write a better book if you've gotten reps earlier in the thing. And, and, but people just want the outcome. They don't want the process. And so I, I think, you know, it's like, if you were trying to lose weight, people are like, I got to change everything. And it's probably like, uh, James Clear talks about this in Atomic Habit. Like, what's the smallest unit of change mm. that you can make? Um, because you can build on that. And, and, and in writing, we say something similar where it's like, you can edit crappy pages and turn them into good pages. You cannot edit pages that don't exist, <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah. and, and so, uh, but people are paralyzed by the idea of having something perfect, mm. um, or something that lives up to their standards. And so they don't start. Yeah. Seth Godin talks about like, people always come to him and say, Oh, I'm a terrible writer. I can yeah. never do that. And he's like, awesome. Let me see your terrible pages. Right. And he was like, they never have any. And yes. he was like, they have this belief that they're not good, but they're not even putting in the work to actually get better and improve, Yes. which going back to that whole notion of perspective, your perspective is going to determine what you pursue. So it's what I call the only belief that matters. The only belief that matters is that you think you can actually get better, that you yes. think by putting in the energy and the effort that will be rewarded with an improvement in your skill set. Yeah. Just, uh, I, what I say is, um, uh, if you don't believe you can do something, you almost certainly cannot do it. But just because you believe you can do something doesn't mean you can do it, right? <laughs> and so when Churchill is saying that, um, you know, uh, perfection can be spelled paralysis with, with the word paralysis, I think he's not saying that you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't try to be really, really, really good. Mm. So like it's a very subtle uh, perspective shift. It's like, oh, no, I'm approaching perfection, but I understand that perfection is impossible. Right. So then you're like, oh, I'm getting better that now progress is possible. Mm. But if you're like, my end goal is to be perfect. You've essentially it's it's a tricky thing because what you're really doing is giving yourself an excuse not to start because, you know, the thing is impossible. Right. Like it, it you can lose weight. You cannot get taller. Right? right. So if you go, my goal is to grow a foot this year. And then if I checked in with you a year later, I'd be like, what'd you do? You'd be like nothing because it's not possible. But if I said Hey, you know, your, your goal is to lose 20 pounds. There's at least things you can do to get there. Well, here's the good news. You actually could get a foot taller. You know about the bone breaking techniques that they use on no. people that have dwarfism and stuff. No, you didn't know about this. No. This is fucking crazy, man. So th this comes down to why I always like, I tell people, look, human potential is nearly limitless. Now yeah. I used to say it's limitless. Yeah. But people just Again, start pushing back on fucking shit. dumb yeah. shit, right? Yeah. Well, you want to talk perspective. Yeah. Like if your perspective is such that you're going to waste your time pushing back on somebody who's saying that right. things are, you know, yes. that human potential is limited. It's like, come on now. Yeah. So act as if. But my thing is the the very reason that I I know that the the law of averages says 
that some massive percentage, is it 20, is it 30%? They legitimately fall below what I'll call minimum requirements. They're not going to be able to make change in their life. Yeah. And it's, I think the U.S. military won't. Um, it's like 40% of the on, male population. It's, it's like a disgusting they, amount. They yes. won't bring on people that have lower than 83 IQ. Oh, I was just going to say uh, that that is a more loaded. My, my, I was responding to like the mil, like fifty percent of the population does not even qualify to be in the military. Is it really it, not? It's, not, it's 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 somewhat intelligent. It's a very large number, but it's like just being overweight. Right. Like they won't take you if you weigh over a certain amount. And you're like the job that was supposed to be. And I'm not saying the military is the lowest, but the that's the, the, entry the level. military that's how you was supposed to be the level up. ultimate equality of of opportunity. Right. Like they're like. We'll take anyone and turn them into excellence. And mm -hmm. then they're like, but these people haven't even gotten to zero. You wow. know what I mean? They're at like negative 50. And you've got to get to zero for us to work our magic. Wow. That's really I didn't wrong. realize that they had weight requirements. Yeah, you can't. Like, you couldn't just enlist in the Marines if you weigh 500 pounds. Actually, I did sort of vaguely know that. But I thought that was for more elite. Do you know David Goggins? Yeah. So they told him, hey, you have to lose 100 pounds yeah. or whatever. In, in like four weeks or some yeah. absurd amount yeah. of time. And the fact that he does it is just right. insanity. Yeah. Um, so going back. So I used to tell people that, um, you know, your human potential is limitless. Yes. And people would push back on the dumbest shit. And the reason that I would say that is I'm, I was so worried that people would assume they fell into like, oh, what I want to do is the thing that can't be done or yeah. whatever. And my thing is, look, if you act as if anything can be done, you're actually better off, even though I know it's yeah. not true. Yeah, like yeah, that sure. is definitively a lie. Sure. But if you act as if it were true, you're much less likely to make the mistake of not trying something that actually is possible. So I'll give a quick example. Um, the bone breaking. Yeah. So you can go in and if you break the bone and then separate it like a centimeter, some very yeah. small increment, the bone will actually grow back together. Yeah. Then you break it again. Yeah. It grows back together and again and again and again. And people that have dwarfism, they can actually, I mean, it's, I don't know what the upper limit yeah. is, but let's say it's, it's gotta be close to a foot. It's pretty crazy. Okay. Someone just did an AMA on Reddit about, Hey, I just grew a foot in the yeah. last, whatever, two years or something doing that technique. So it's fucking crazy. The number of things that you can do that people just assume you can't, there was another yes. one. I had this guy on, Oh, can I remember his name? He was on impact theory. Oh, um, neuroscientist. I'm blanking on his name right now. I'm so sad. He was so cool. Israeli guy, yeah. really interesting. And he was um, doing some studying and he basically did a sort of this, a technique of brain scanning that if you sort of carried it out to his logical conclusion, like it could record dreams. And yeah. so somebody, he publishes a paper on it. Somebody calls him in the middle of the night and says, so are you saying that you can record dreams? And he is like half asleep. He's fucking yeah. exhausted. And he ends up saying, well, yeah, I guess you could. And then the next day, the headline reads, neuroscientist says that you can record dreams. Yeah. And he's, he panics and he's like, I'm going to get kicked out of academia. Like everyone's yeah. going to realize I'm a quack fuck. And he's trying to rescind it and it, it just won't go away. And for a year, it just runs out of control. And people are saying that, oh my God, this is possible. And he's trying to retract it. Nobody will let him retract it. And he has all this anxiety about it. And he's really freaking out that it's going to end his career. And then finally it dies down and, yeah. and he just sort of closes the door on it. And then like a year later, this Japanese researcher publishes a paper about how they recorded dreams. <laughs> wow. And he was like, what the hell? And the, the guy says, oh, because of you saying that you were already doing it, I just assumed that it could be done. And so I started doing sure. it. And so he says that the ultimate lesson he took away was not to say something is possible when you believe it's not possible. He said, the lesson I learned was not to say something is impossible yeah. before you really go out and prove that it can't be done. Look, I don't, and, and it's so interesting because people think because of my stuff in stoicism that I'm like somewhat pessimistic or resigned or like the Stoics are very clear on this too. I mean, the, one of my favorite passages in Marcus Realis, he goes, if it's humanly possible, assume you can do it also. So it's the same thing. It's just um, being realistic doesn't mean you're being pessimistic necessarily. It mm. tends to be that way for a lot of people, but um if, if you have a good sense of what is actually literally possible um, or, or you've studied history enough to see just the magnificent things human beings are capable of doing and, and how regularly they disprove our assumptions about things, mm -hmm. you do have a you, you don't go around thinking like, oh, I'm I have very little agency. <laughs> you know what I mean? You actually have the sense that like actually you can sort of change the world or or or, you know, change yourself at any moment. We 
tend to think of space and time as the basic level of reality. Everything that could possibly be is inside space and has some, some time. The Big Bang was the start of it all, and who knows what the end will be, maybe a big crunch or just petering out in low entropy and low temperature, we don't know yet. But that, we think, or we thought, is the basis of all reality. Mm. So space and time are the, the basic stage on which all of reality plays out. And how can it most not it, be though? That's the weird thing. Yeah. Does we, that mean that whatever is real, and we should probably give people your um, headset metaverse explanation, which speaks dear to my heart, but before we do that, does that mean that whatever is real is non-physical? Well, so the word real is a little slippery. So um, in some sense, my headache is real, right? Because it's a real experience. Mm -hmm. But um, it, real in the sense that the physicists are talking about it, when they thought that space and time were fundamental, they were thinking that this was the fundamental ground of all possible realities. Um, like in a Newtonian universe and even in Einstein's point of view. Einstein thought that space and time was the grounding reality for everything. And now we realize that the four dimensions of space-time, or even uh, ten dimensions of string theory or something like that, is not going deep enough. There are structures entirely beyond space-time and entirely beyond quantum theory. So, so these new structures are not like little structures sitting inside at the, the, the small scales of space-time. I don't think we can get to structures yet. People are going to be super lost. So, okay. The idea of the headset, I think, is okay. a really core concept. So yeah. uh, somebody asked you once, like, in the future, we're going to start using different metaphors. What metaphors do you think we're going to use? And you said the metaverse. Right. As somebody trying to contribute to the metaverse, my ears perked up on that okay, one. Right, right. Why will that become such a useful metaphor for, for this moment and how we perceive things? Right. Because the way that evolution speaks on this is it says that our perceptions of, of objects in space and time is really just like a virtual reality headset. It's there to help you play the game of life without knowing what's on the other side of the headset, what's on the other side, what, what's the hardware and software that's running the game. You don't have to know that to play the game. And in fact, if you were trying to play a game of like uh, Grand Theft Auto in virtual reality, and uh, you, know, you had to toggle millions of voltages per second to drive your car, uh, you would lose when you were you know, competing with someone who could just turn a nice little simple steering wheel and press on an artificial gas pedal. Mm. So evolution gave us senses that allow us to survive by hiding the truth and just telling us how to act. So as the evolutionary theorist would say, our senses guide adaptive behavior. Why does natural selection as a theory predict that? Because I understand the theory, I guess, well enough at a high level, but mm -hmm. I never would have guessed that it actually says right. that it makes a prediction anyway that you, whatever is real, the only thing I can tell you that evolution has selected for is not that. Right. So where, like, would, uh, is this something that Darwin himself saw in his theory or would he be surprised? I think Darwin would be surprised. And in fact, um, many... Um, evolutionary theorists today are surprised. And, and so how do we know this isn't just a kooky interpretation of natural selection by Donald Hoffman? Exactly. So the, the way we pursue this is it turns out that Darwin's theory has been turned into a mathematically precise theory. It's called evolutionary game theory. So John Maynard Smith started that in, in the 1970s. And so we now have, in, instead of, you know, Darwin's theory, which is, you know, it's imprecise in the sense that it's not a mathematical model. Mm. Evolutionary game theory, evolutionary graph theory are mathematically precise. So we can now prove theorems and we can ask technical questions. So what is the probability that natural selection would shape any sensory system of any organism to reveal any true structures of objective reality? That's a clean technical question. And it turns out that evolutionary game theory is precise enough to address that question. And okay, so I know I've gotten hung up on that a lot. And I think 
for people of my cognitive ability, we will have to accept that as the miracle of this conversation. Otherwise, we'll derail on that because I don't understand how his theory can be turned into a math equation. And I worry that for you to explain it to me would take uh, an entire semester and cause me to tear my hair out. But so if we can accept, unless you're thinking, it looks like you may I have a way to explain it. I can give you a hint. It. I okay. can give a little hint. It's when we say evolutionary game theory, mm -hmm. It real, think about game theory. How do you play Monopoly and win? How do you play various games? So it turns out you can look at different strategies that someone might have. You know, I'm going to go for Park Place. I'm going to go for Boardwalk. I'm going to try to... There's all different strategies. And you can then write down mathematically, okay, if you take this strategy, what is the probability that you will do well against someone who's taking this other strategy? And it's all about most offspring? And, and the, so the strategies are ways to survive long enough to reproduce. And so you can look at different strategies for playing the game of life. So, for example, some organisms will have millions or thousands of offspring. Mm. And, but they don't care about the offspring. Most of them will die. But if 1% of them make it, you're good. Humans tend to have just a couple, a handful of offspring, and we put a lot of effort into them. So those are different strategies. And so as you look, so some uh, strategies, for example, in perception, humans really have focused in our evolution on vision and, and hearing and less on smell and, and taste and so forth. Other organisms f focus on things that we don't even have, like echolocation mm -hmm. in bats. So different organisms will take different strategies. The game of life is how do I live long enough to reproduce? And how do I raise my offspring to maturity? No, do, I, do I just make lots of them and let them fend for themselves? And most of them die, but a fraction will make it. Or do I make just a few of them and really help them for 20 or 30 years until they can go on their own? Or more these days. Or more of those days. So by, from evolutionary game theory's perspective, what is the most successful creature on planet Earth? Uh, pro well, probably bacteria. Um, Interesting, right? Well, they, yeah. they, there, there's a yeah. lot more bacteria than wow, there are good answer. Uh, uh, than us, and and maybe viruses if they're more. So from that point of view, um, right? It, the 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 winner is the one who um, per, you know survives long enough to reproduce and reproduces for a long period of time. And you know, cyanobacteria have been around for billions of years. So you know, they're they're certainly candidates. I'm not saying that they're the final answer, but right. that kind of thing would be. Humans are you know relative newcomers, and I l I actually really like the theory that humans are bacteria's way of moving around, yeah. which is pretty interesting when you think that we're outnumbered by the right, bacteria right. in our guts, on our skin, right. and all of that stuff. It's pretty interesting. I right. should have guessed that answer, but I didn't. But that makes a lot of sense. Right, right. So so this gives you the idea of when you're playing a game. There's lots of strategies, especially in a complicated game, there's lots of strategies. And it's not that there's going to be one best strategy. It's rather that if, so, you know, if Tom is using this strategy, what, should, what strategy should I use to counter Tom's strategy? Mm. And, and so forth. Same thing in business, right? It depends on who your competition is, yeah. what strategies you're going to take. And what is the govern, governing system and so forth, like with the laws and so forth. That, that will all determine your strategy. So you can use game theory and turn it into a tool for studying evolution as a game where your know, bacteria are trying to play the game of life one way, humans are playing the game of life another way. Every different organism, every different plant mm. is playing the game of life with a different kind of strategy. That's really interesting. It's funny. I, I, this is the third time I've interviewed you and I've never pushed on this because there was something about I couldn't wrap my brain around it. So I'm glad you took the time. Yeah. Uh, what's fascinating to me is every species has its own umwelt, yes, right. which is a really fascinating concept. So I looked this up once, and every time I say this stat, I think I must be wrong because it just seems way too far off. But humans are able to perceive 0.0035% of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And I was like, how is that possible? That's so, like every, everything that we see and think of as the, the known world is 0.0035%. Right. That is like vanishingly small. Exactly right. So our, our window on the, on the world is trivial mm. compared to what could in principle be available. And so the, the question that you can then ask in a technical fashion is, what is the probability that a strategy of seeing 
truth, true structures about objective reality. Would, would that strategy help you to survive long enough to raise kids? Mm. And so we can ask that as a technical question. Evolution has the tools to do that. And the key concept is something called a fitness payoff. So it's, fitness payoff is like, if you're playing a game, there's a certain way that you get points in the game. If you're playing a video game, right, you have to shoot things down or avoid getting hit and to get points. And if you get enough points, you get to the next level of the game. Well, fitness payoffs, um, if you get enough fitness payoffs, what that corresponds to is you're surviving long enough to reproduce and you don't go to the next level of the game, but your offspring and your DNA in your offspring go to the next level of the game. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the Mindset and Business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. So here's the, here's the big idea. We can ask these fitness payoff functions that govern our evolution. They do depend on whatever the world is and the world structure. So they do depend on the world. They depend on the organism. You know, what's fit for me is not fit for a benthic fish. Being 5,000 meters under the water would kill me. It's just what the benthic fish wants. So, so the fitness payoffs depend on the true structure of the world depends on the organism, you know, Hoffman versus a fish, and the, um, the action, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating, and, and so forth. And you can then ask, what is the probability? And this is, now, this is the key technical question. What is the probability that a, a randomly chosen fitness payoff function that's governing my evolution has information about the true structure of the world? Mm. Right? Because it's that fit, evolution tells us those fitness payoffs are what determine how your senses are going to evolve. They're so going to what's the base assumption there that the that reality is so complex? In fact, I want to press, I want to take a second to really elucidate the example you gave about Grand Theft Auto, which I think is so brilliant. What's actually happening in Grand Theft Auto is um, electrical currents are toggling on and off gates on the computer and that somehow makes things happen on your screen that you can interact with and score points and all that. Right. But at, like, if you look at a chip, it is so complicated that uh, trying to like zap electrodes in the right order, it, literally impossible. Right. And so everything that we, we as the average non-computer programmer think of as a computer is really just the GUI, it's the interface. And so you're there at a really, abs really abstracted level. It is so abstract as to be nonsensical compared to what's actually happening at the electrical communication level with the machinery itself sending signals to your TV. Exactly. And if real life has that same level of complexity, then I get why it would need to be so abstracted that as to be just nonsensical compared to what reality really is. Something I think breaks in people's intuition, it certainly breaks in my intuition, okay. when I think though that there has to be some sort of mapping. So the example that you've said many times, which I think is really on point is, uh, if people are gonna make fun of you, what they will say is, oh, you don't think any of this is real? Go ahead and step in front of that train right, and right, see if right. it kills you. Right. And of course it's going to. So the representation of the train is pointing at something that right. will change your state from alive to dead. That's right. Now, whether all of that is, is so, again, abstracted from what's actually happening at a electrical level, I don't even know what to liken it to, um, but nonetheless, stepping in front of a train will flip you from alive to dead, whatever that means in right. the, the right. underlying reality. <laughs> so do you think at all about like, do you care what it's mapping to, or are you just like, eh, it doesn't matter, it's too complicated, we're not there yet? Well, I do care, and that's why I'm interested in this particular theorem, right? Because my interest is, I'm seeing a world of space and time and objects with colors and shapes and motions. How is, is that the true world? Is that the, the true structure of objective reality? Or is this 
as divorced from reality, is what we're seeing as divorced from the fundamental reality as my Grand Theft Auto VR headset is from the voltages inside the supercomputer that's running it. Mm. That's, the, that's the simple question, right? So when I talk about things outside of space time, it's just like, if, if, suppose someone had played Grand Theft Auto since they were one day old and their parents had left them in a headset their whole life. And when they're 25, the parents say, guess what? You've been in a headset your whole life. And, and that, that person probably can't even, what could possibly be outside of my headset? Mm -hmm. I've lived my whole life inside this headset. And you pull it off and you realize, oh wow, there's a whole world that's entirely outside of what you're in. That's the question we're asking. Has, has evolution shaped us with just a little headset, a VR headset, that, that guides adaptive behavior but shows us none of objective reality. That's, that's the technical question. And the answer is, is very, very clear. The probability is one, that we don't see the truth at all. Meaning 100%. 100%. Okay, so if the probability is 100% that you are seeing a very false version, right. the, the thing that that seems to predict to me is that the underlying reality is so complicated that at least in this form, I don't know how else to refer to that, in this form, it would, with our umwelt, our ability to process data, whatever, it would not make sense to try to, um, to deal with the reality, that it's far more efficient to create an abstraction layer. But if underlying reality is dead simple, that doesn't seem like it would hold true. So do we just presume that there is extreme complexity? Well, it turns out that the extreme complexity isn't necessary for this theorem to be true. Interesting. Why would you need such an elaborate abstraction if it isn't complicated? Well, so it turns out when you actually just look at the math, so suppose the world has some number of states, a billion states or a or hundred states, whatever it might, so there's some number of states in the world. And you have some number of states of perception. I can see green, red, there's lots of things I can see. When you just do a simple count, look at all the possible functions from the states of the world to the states of my perception, you just count them. So it doesn't, the world doesn't have to be complicated. It could have just you know, 100 points or 1,000 points. When you count those, all the functions in, that are the fitness functions and ask how many of those functions actually contain information about the structures in the, in the world, it turns out that very quickly the proportion goes to zero. It's just, it's, it, so even if the structure isn't that complicated, maybe there's only one structure in the world Mm -hmm. that, that's all it has, like a total order. Something, you know, one is less than two, is less than three, is less. What is the probability that that total order, so the world could be very simple. It only has one simple structure, total order, and, it, and the world only has, you know, maybe you know, a, a million states. So it's not a very complicated world, a million states. What is the probability that um, the fitness payoff functions that govern my, my evolution would preserve the total order information, would, would actually be able to tell me about the total order? And the math is quite simple, and the answer is zero. But that has to predict something. Uh, like, so when, when I make mm -hmm. the base assumption that it's, it's because it is too complex. So to give people, I want to start putting definitions of some of these words. So when sure. you say state, let's say lights on, lights off. So sure. we all mm -hmm. live where Earth has two states. The sun is up, the sun is down. That's one. Uh, right. Temperature would be another state. Could be hot, could be cold. Right. Uh, barometric pressure could be high, could be low. Could be right. wet, could be dry. Like we right. can just, so there's a lot of different things. And exactly. so to your point about the fish, they're dealing with massive pressures. Right. If right. they were to come up where there's no pressure, they would disintegrate or not be able to move or whatever, just like we crush down to the, you know, like a tiny can. So yeah, they would explode and we would crush. Right, exactly. exactly. Right. Right. So, okay, that when you say states, Mm -hmm. That's one example. Exactly I right. don't understand how if everything were static, it were one state, that we would need an abstraction layer to navigate it more effectively than somebody that sees objective reality. So now I'm going to use an example sure. to further okay. illustrate what I mean. I'm going to use an example you gave me the first time. You cannot imagine how many times I've quoted you on this. Okay. You said, uh, Tom, you have to understand that objective reality isn't like, oh, here's a table and it's got this nice swirly grain pattern. It's the number of photons reflecting off of that desk and the, the amount of reflectivity and all that. Now, irony of ironies, as I have started working in the metaverse, you realize how complicated the visual world is. The, the 0.0035% of the right, visual right. spectrum that we actually see is insanely complicated to replicate. Right, right. 
Donald, right, right. It, it's the hardest thing I've done in my life. It's crazy. And I don't even have to fully understand it. I just have to guide the team that understands it. Anyway, right. when you said that, I was like, whoa, right. what reality is, is very different than how I experience it. So cool, complex. Right. So now I get why the math works out. Right. But if it isn't complex, so you don't seem to be struggling with this. What is it that you understand that I don't, or what is your base assumption right. that's right. different than mine that makes it make sense to you that to achieve maximum fitness payoff, you would 100% not retain elements of reality. Right, so, so first I, I don't deny that, I, I suspect that reality is very complicated. So, so my, but my that point- isn't necessary but that's for not this necessary for this, that's right. It's just simply accounting things. So if you, if you look at all the functions from one set to another set, like, so I have functions for, say I have numbers one through 10, and that's my base set, and I'm gonna map them into numbers one through 10. So I can map one to three and two to five and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you, if you just do, okay, you, if you think about that problem, you, you, I could probably figure out, okay, how many different functions are there, right? So you can write, the, write down all, now you can say, okay, how many of those functions have the property that, um, you know, they preserve that one is less than two is less than three and less than four. How many of them scramble that order? How many preserve that order? How many scramble? How many contain information about the one less, less than two, less than three, less than four? So this is called combinatorics. It's a branch of mathematics. Oh, I'm unfortunately all too aware of it because of NFTs. Yes. Which require you to understand this because you're making, you have, to your point, and maybe this is what you're saying, and so maybe I actually now am understanding it. Okay. Let me walk you through sure, what sure. we had to discover in NFTs. Okay, so you create all these traits, right. all these categories, I should say, right. and then within each category, you have maybe 10 possible eyebrows that it could be, eyeball right. types, hairstyles, right. uh, facial hair, so on and so forth. That outputs, let's say, 2 billion right. potential permutations. Exactly right. But you want to maintain a distribution in the 10,000 that you're actually gonna show. So we were all trying to do the math and we're working it out. And I'm like, there's no way it's as simple. No. There's some problem. And then we showed it to physicists and they fell out laughing and they're like, yeah, it's not that simple. <laughs> and so they're right. like, for you to maintain exactly the, right. the, um, the percentage likelihood to get gold eyes, let's say, right, right. out of your 2 billion combinations, they're like, you have to force it down into this thing, which they called the combinatorial or whatever. And so yeah, I was like, right. okay. And so that's, that really is the point here that even though I agree with you that the universe is probably, the real universe, whatever it is, is very complicated. I, I believe that. Combinatorics blow up so quickly. Got it. By the time you just get to a few hundred elements, you know, that as you found, the thing, the explosion of possibilities is so great that when I ask how many of those possible fitness functions would actually be so special that they contain information about the structure of where they mm. came from out of all of the possible fitness functions that so were- So it's not an overly complicated world, it's just the number of potential mapping points and combinations. Exactly right. Very because, interesting. Because evolutionary theory puts no restriction on the fitness payoff functions. Any possible- I mean, there could be as many as you can imagine. And there's no restriction. That's there's no restriction the that says they have to show you the truth. That's not part of the theory. Right. So until so and and by the way no one knows how to put that into the theory right so i mean to say that it requires that only the fitness functions that preserve the truth would be a major revision to evolutionary theory it would, it would be unrecognizable hmm. so so when you look then and say okay every fitness payoff function is is equal likely as any other fitness payoff function they're all on equal footing and then you count the ones that actually have information about the truth they go to zero probability right. in fast order. Now there is one I should bring out, there's um, a group at Yale that has recently published a paper that's trying to um, push back on this. And what they say is if you have, say, a, a bunch of, like thousands of fitness path functions, they're all radically different. Then they say that you'll be forced to, um, to go to the truth. And, and they, the, the argument that they make is, that if our high-level cognitions, our beliefs, our goals, and so forth, 
are not going to interfere with our perceptions. They claim that then our perceptions have to map, have a single mapping from the state of the world into the state of our senses. It has to be a single mapping. You can't have more. So, <clears throat> because one thing I could do with a lot of fitness functions is to say, well, this fitness function is different from that one. So I will do this kind of mapping from the world into my senses with this fitness payoff function. <clears throat> then I'll do another mapping with this fitness payoff function. And, and they say, you know, if you're going to have what we call um, cognitive impenetrability. So what you believe cognitively cannot affect um, what you see. Okay, that's, that's the argument. Then you must have only one mapping. Well, it, it, so that's their assumption. So hold on, let me make sure I sure. understand that. Sure. So they're saying that basically so that your delusions don't create the exterior world or at least your perception of it, you have to have this mapping so that you're actually detecting and seeing what is real? They're, they're saying that if what you believe mm -hmm. doesn't affect your senses in a fundamental way, yep. then they claim that that entails that you can only have one mapping from the world, the fitness, the, the, the mapping of your senses from the, whatever the world is into what, what you're seeing, the colors and the shapes and so forth. There, there can only be one map um, that, that holds regardless of what the fitness payoff function is. That was their claim. So, and, and the only reason I bring this up is because this is a recently published paper. The, the claim is false. It, it's, it's trivial to show counterexamples. Their, their fundamental claim is false. Please do as a way just to make sure that I actually understand what they're saying. Because this sounds like what they're trying to protect against is um, hallucinations basically becoming subjectively real. Right. So, so I actually think that it's true probably to a large extent that what we believe does not really affect fundamentally what we see. So technical term we use, the geek term is cognitive impenetrability of perception. Mm -hmm. That's what the philosophers of science will talk about and cognitive scientists that are, are, and you can think about scientists might like this because they'll say, look, we want to use our senses in our experiments. I want to, my theory makes a prediction. I have to go look and see if the prediction is true. Well, if my theory that I'm holding would change what I see, then science isn't going to really be objective, right? I mean, if I believe this theory and it changes how I see the data, then I might just see the data that confirms the theory and I can't escape. So that's why there's, the philosophy of science has been very interested in this question. Are our high-level theoretical beliefs and just our beliefs as everyday people, do they get in there and somehow fundamentally affect how we see the world? And there is a, you know, a, a, Sort of a way you could say they, you know, I, the way I believe things does change my world, but not. They don't change like the color I see right. or the three-dimensional structure of the cube here that I'm seeing. I mean, they, they might change it in some way, but but not fundamentally like that. So that's the that's the question, and so it's it's trivial. I mean, so when the group at Yale makes this point that you know if you have lots of different fit fitness payoff functions and you don't have your high-level beliefs interfering with the process of perception, then you can only have one, one map from the world into your senses. And of course, they, they don't prove that. They, they just state it without proof. Mm. And so it's, it's trivially false. We, we have made counterexamples. It's very, very easy to make counterexamples. I can design a system in which I have, say, two fitness payoff functions. And I, I use one fitness payoff function to make one map from the world into uh, my perceptions, use the other fitness function to make another map. and if I have a system that has no high-level beliefs, then the high-level beliefs aren't interfering with it. There's mm -hmm. a counterexample right there. No cognitive penetration of perception, multiple maps. But then I can add beliefs and say, I know I can have beliefs there as long as they don't interfere with this mapping here. I could have two, ma two maps. Why not? So it, it's, they're, they're, the guys, the, the group at Yale, they're brilliant experimentalists. And you know, one of them is a, a really good friend of, of one of my collaborators. I mean, they were postdocs at MIT together and so forth. So they're brilliant experimentalists, but the fundamental assumption that they're making is just trivially false. And so, so then, what, how do we see this in our perceptions? The way we see it in our perceptions is we have probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of fitness payoff functions that are governing our, be our behavior. So what do we do with all that complexity? What we do is we group the fitness payoff functions into groups that are similar. And we take that and we make simple little data structures out of them. And those data structures are what we call objects. So this object 
is good for drinking. Can you, what, what is a data structure? When you say that it's an object, meaning my mind groups it so that I can differentiate the cup from the coaster from the desk? What I'm saying is we're making all this stuff up as a simple way to represent the fitnesses, fitness payoffs and how to get them. So, so for example, in, when you're playing Grand Theft Auto, mm -hmm. and you're, you're playing a game, um, if you looked inside the supercomputer, there, there is no red Porsche, there is no steering wheel, there is no gas pedal. In some sense, those are what I call simple data structures. Mm. They're coding for you know, the gas pedal and pushing on the gas pedal is coding for who knows, countless millions of voltage changes happening in, in, in exactly the right sequence in the computer. I have this trivial data structure, gas pedal, push on it, that triggers this whole other thing that I don't want to know about. It's really too complicated. So that's what I mean by these simplifying data structures. My steering wheel is this simple data structure that I can use to interact with who knows how many billions or trillions of voltages and make them do exactly the right sequence in the right order. Could I say representation instead of data structure? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Data structure is a, a computer science term, so computer scientists would, would be very happy with that, but, but representation is, is perfectly good. And so the idea then is what evolution has done from an evolutionary point of view is it takes all these fitness payoff functions that govern us, that govern our, our survival and that we need to respect in order to play the game of life, and we organize them. So an apple is, is an object. It's a representation of a bunch of fitness payoffs. For example, the apple, if I'm interested in mating, apple's no good. If I'm interested in eating, great. If I'm interested in a weapon, so-so. I mean, I could throw it at someone's head, but it's not going to do much damage. You know, if I'm, you know, so there's, if, but if I have a sword, a sword, well, for, for mating, no good. For eating, not really. I mean, I could use it to cut a coconut in half, but, but I, can't eat the, I can't eat the sword. For fighting, great, but not if you're fighting against a, you know, a gun mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So every object, and we can recognize, I would say, on the order of 30 or 40,000 different objects, basic kinds of objects. So what that indicates is that evolution has taken all these hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of fitness payoff functions, and it's not making one map from the world into our senses. It's making a bunch of different maps, and those different maps are what we call objects. And our high-level cognition, all it does is, I, I'm hungry. Okay, well, I won't be looking for tables. I won't be looking for the moon. I'll be looking for apples and bananas and things like that. Those data structures, those representations that have high fitness payoffs for, for the action of eating. And so visual attention, paying attention to different objects, is our way of switching from this representation of fitness payoffs to this representation of fitness payoffs as I need to be able to, to do to survive long enough to reproduce. And so that's so, so I, I, this sort of technical, but it's, the reason I bring it out is because you know, this is brand new. It, it's gotten you know, a lot of attention from Yale. And so it's an important thing from the scientific side to, to really lay to rest that, that you know, there's not one mapping that's required from the world into our senses by evolution, even if we assume that uh, our, our beliefs don't interfere with our cognition, uh, our cognitions don't interfere with our perceptions. That doesn't entail that we have to have one mapping. Um, it's just a false assumption. Once you let go of that false assumption, then you are opened up to realize that objects, every object, he is just a data structure coding for a whole group of fitness payoffs, and that's how evolution deals with this. Let's talk about healthy anger for a minute, if you could, mm. okay? Um, then I'll illustrate these traits, okay? What is healthy anger? Why are we given healthy anger? So there's a, there's a system in our brain for anger. Not just for us, mammals. What is it there for? is there to protect our boundaries. Somebody that invades your space, physically, or in the case of human beings emotionally, used to say, no, stay out. That's the role of healthy anger. Now, if, rest, if I repress that healthy anger, what would happen to, you, to me in life? People would be just trespassing all over me all the time because I had no boundaries. So healthy anger is a boundary defense. 
Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Healthy anger is a boundary defense. It just says... It seems like one of its uses, I'll be honest. I don't know that I'd say it's its only use, but I don't know if Healthy that anger, that's its only use. That's its major use. Just boundary protection. That's its major use. That's why it came along. Animals have it. You're in my space. Ah! Get How out. far are you extending that to loved ones? So now if you encroach upon a loved one... Well, if your loved one intrudes your space emotionally... No, I mean if somebody else is intruding on my loved one... Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. Way. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's you or your loved ones, anything you cherish. Absolutely, for sure. So that's healthy anger. So the role of anger is to set a boundary between what's nourishing... Uh, you know, to, to, to let in... The lot of healthy anger is to keep up what's dangerous and unwelcome, Right? What's the role of the emotional system in general? Is to let in what's healthy and nurturing and to keep up what's dangerous and unwelcome. Is that fair enough? Seems good. What's the role of the immune system? Same, basically. Exactly, it's the same. The role of the immune system is to keep up what's dangerous and toxic, allowing what's nourishing and healthy. The immune system and, then, and the emotional system are not separate systems. They're part and parcel of the same apparatus. They're unified. When you suppress the emotions, you're also suppressing the immune system. When you, set, when, you, when, you, when you don't know how to defend your emotional boundaries, that also um, weakens your immune boundaries physiologically. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Or if you repress the anger, that anger doesn't go away doesn't evaporate into the heavens, it turns against you in the form of depression or self-loathing and so on. In the same way, the immune system turns against you and now you have autoimmune disease. And so the traits that were identified with chronic illness, most chronic illness like cancers or immune disease are emotional self-suppression, inability to experience healthy anger, desire to please others, to fit in, to be acceptable, to be nice, um, to be ignoring of your own needs. These are the traits that are over and over and again identified in the literature, whether with multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or with cancer. Now, these are, not the real per these are not the real person. These are adaptive traits in response to the childhood environment, but they take a heavy toll. Or take another so-called illness. And by the way, the case I'm making is that what we call illness is actually response to life. So take, a, take depression, this so-called biological disease of the brain. What does it mean to depress something? Try to push it down. To push it down. What gets pushed on, what's get pushed on in depression? Well, I can tell you, I've been depressed. What gets pushed on depression is your natural emotions. Everything is flat. And nothing matters, nothing has any meaning. And that yeah. starts with people pushing them down? That's, that's, the word, that's what the word means. <laughs> it means to push it down. It starts in childhood with pe people having to push down their emotions. Why do they have to push down their emotions? To fit in with other people's expectations. So, and I don't know the literature on this at all. So there, oftentimes then the depression will just sort of creep in slowly. I always assumed it was tied to something being stuck in um, a bad relationship, a death in the family, loss of a job, that there would be some sort of triggering event. Well, the, okay, fair enough. If you're in a bad relationship, the healthy response is not depression, but to deal with the challenges in the, re in the relationship, either by working them out or by leaving the relationship. Depression is not a necessary outcome. The response to the death of a close one, of a close one, is not depression, it's grief. Grief is the healthy response. We have a system in our brain for grief, by the way. So grief becomes depression when you're not allowing yourself to grieve. But you don't know how to grieve properly, yeah. And you don't know how to grieve properly because your emotions were suppressed as a child. And uh, so, yeah, we have uh, these healthy systems but they get, their activity gets deformed through our natural expectations. Okay, so to stay with depression for a minute, so you're pushing all this stuff down, it yeah. starts in early childhood, you're trying yeah. to fit in, you yeah. want 
unconditional love, you're not getting it. So you have this directive for attachment. And so you begin to, oh, I see what I can do. If I, if I don't yell, scream, if I'm not expressing frustration, yeah. if I'm the caretaker or whatever that situation demands, then all is well. So now I've learned this adaptive response to suppress my emotions. And over time, it begins to numb me, I would assume. I have yeah. not been depressed, so, okay. but, uh, so you're beginning to be numbed, but now something it gets starts to be very extreme. And yeah. you, what I have heard depression explained as is just like, the skies are permanently gray. You will yeah. never see joy again. Yeah. And so yeah. what what is breaking in that, that like the beach ball analogy I like, right? I'm pushing something under the water, but if I stop pushing, it will pop back up. And exactly. so if that thing or my emotions is when you're treating depression, let's say non-pharmacologically, is it the release of the pressure on those emotions to let them finally come up? Yeah, so the, so the, the difference between the pushing the beach ball down is that I'm doing it consciously and deliberately. Mm. But the repression of emotions that a child um, engages in is not conscious, is not deliberate. It's an automatic response, it's unconscious. Therefore, the child can't just let go like that. And then as you say, it numbs and, and, and becomes overall a depression. Now the, by the way, I'm not against pharmacological treatment. I've taken antidepressants, they have helped me. So I'm not here to advocate against them. Mm. I, I could talk about their misuse, but in principle, sometimes they're helpful and occasionally they're life-saving. And much of the time, they're over-prescribed for way too long and we're not dealing with the real issues because the pharmacology deals with the symptom but it doesn't deal with the underlying problem. So yes, the healing of depression, and I talk, you know, the last, the, the, the final part and the longest part of the book really is on healing, is you have to reconnect to yourself so you can feel your emotions. That's the treatment of depression. Talk to me about reconnecting. How do you reconnect? What is that process? Well, uh, first of all, you recognize that you're disconnected. And you notice how that disconnect shows up in, a, in so many areas of your life. Uh, in your, on the job or in, the, uh, in your personal relationships, for example, or on your relationship to yourself. So you have to become aware. And this is where I talk about disease, whether it's physical or so-called mental, um, as teacher. Not that I recommend illness as a way of learning to anybody. It's, it's not my but preferred. But if it happens. But if it happens, it can actually teach you. Mm. And you can ask yourself, what have you been pushing down? And what are the stories? Why do I push it down? Oh, I pushed on emotions because I've learned, I have the belief that if I'm angry, I'm a bad person. Well, is that really true? Is a person that experiences anger really a bad person? Um, I learned that if I push down my needs, uh, then people will love me. Do I really, be, do I really be lo want to be loved at the expense of disconnecting from myself? As a child, I had no choice because I had to be loved or connected with, otherwise I wouldn't have survived. Is it still like that? So. Basically, it's a gradual. Isn't it though? Sorry? Isn't it like, isn't it? In fact, this is my overarching question. And somebody yeah. that has helped so many people through therapy, you probably yeah. have the answer or an insight. But as we become adults, yeah. you don't have like other than your parents, should yeah. you be lucky enough that they're still alive. But man, out in the outside world, pe people do want you to act a certain way. And if you don't, they're not going to be around you. Like, I'll just be honest. If somebody's throwing a tantrum as an adult, I don't have time for that. But an adult doesn't throw a tantrum. Are you uh, sure? Yeah. Like that, that, I have seen adults throw what no, I would you call the adult version You've of the tantrum. You've seen adult, you have children in adult bodies throw tantrums. Interesting, okay, yeah. go on. You know, so the, ad the adult who throws a tantrum, he's a traumatized child who has not developed self-regulation. I'm not talking about repression of self, but regulation. So for example. Help me differentiate. So, so for example, I throw up at the airline counter, and uh, they've um, overbooked the airplane, okay? My healthy response is disappointment and some degree of anger. I'd say, this is not right that you did this. I want you to redress it. You do something about it, please. 
throwing a tantrum, yelling at the poor clerk behind the counter who had nothing to do with creating the problem, who's just trying to do her job and trying to help me as best she can. Is that, that's not a mature adult. That's a child whose midfrontal cortex or self-regulation has gone offline and his emotional circuits have taken over. Believe me, I've been an adult child very often in my life, as my wife could tell, me, tell you. So uh, that's not an adult. Okay, so then the process there goes back to connect to yourself, figure out why you're repressing this. Yeah. Let go of those things that are keeping it down. Find a way to um, be able to regulate yourself so that they're sort of contextually yeah. uh, sensical so that we're not in unhealthy anger territory. Um, okay, interesting. So trauma is, um, is an imprint that makes you react to the present like you're still a child, essentially. I mean, that's a very narrow definition of trauma, mm -hmm. that's one of its essential aspects. And that the important thing that you said earlier is it's automatic. It's automatic, it's unwilled, it's automatic. And it's, um, and actually, when you look at the brain scans of deeply traumatized people, the prefrontal cortex is totally asleep. And the emotional circuits, you know, they're, the, 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 the primitive emotional responses are active. This is why so, many of, so much of the jail population are traumatized people. That's why they end up in jail. But instead of dealing with their trauma and helping them develop, which they could, under the right circumstances, become adult people, self-regulated, the jails just make it worse mm. by, the way, the, by the way they torment people and the way they traumatize people even further. So when I talk about a trauma-informed society, informed society, what if we actually understood trauma? What if we just actually understood it? It would have huge implications for medical school, for medical uh, health delivery. What if when you went to the doctor with your depression, you weren't just told, you got this biological disease of the brain, here's a pill. But they actually said, what happened to you as a child? One of the people I quote in the book is the great uh, pediatrician, psychiatrist, neuroscientist, uh, Bruce Perry, who just wrote a book with Oprah, the title of which is called, What Happened to You? Mm. Not what's wrong with you, what <laughs> happened to you? What if we ask that question? You know, so that would change medical treatment completely. What if in, ju in, the, in, the, in the prison system or in the legal system, we didn't just say, what did you do? But what happened to you that made you do it? Now that wouldn't mean that we allow or encourage antisocial behavior, but it would mean that we would actually want to rehab rehabilitate people and to help them become who they could be. You know, that's a very different legal concept. What if in education, it was kids' developmental needs that were put paramount rather than their performance. It's interesting. How would you do that functionally? What would school look like? Well, I talk about it a bit. Like schools in, in Finland, there's much more play. There's much more freedom. And they have much better results than we do. So that, we, in other words, we honor What the, are the right results to look at? A child who's curious, who wants to learn, who's engaged, who is um, respectful of others, um, who is confident, um, that would be the right results. Then you don't have to worry about stuffing knowledge down their throats. Why? Because they want to learn. They want to learn. So you don't have to punish them, you don't have to reward them. You just present them with the opportunities to learn, and they will. That's a natural human attribute. We kill that in this society. There's uh, an application to free will, right? We live life thinking we make decisions all the time and are responsible for our decisions and also kind of determined and defined by those. So if I ask you what you want to have for lunch and I offer you five different things and you make a choice, then your choice is somehow your identity. This is right. like what you, what you care about. And if I told you right now that I could predict what you're going to choose an hour before you made the choice, a day, 20 years before, it kind of takes away some of our identity in a way, mm. but also kind of gives us meaning because it says, okay, there is actually a narrative that we carry with us throughout life. And now, now the choice has become really something that defines who we are, not just 
the moment of, but as a person in the world. Mm. So I always care about like free will, understanding it, predicting it, and also using it to change things. So if you if you think that, okay, all my choices are kind of determined, do I have any meaning to my life? The answer is they're not determined. We do have control over them, and that's what makes us kind of human. So you believe that we do have free will, or you believe that it's totally different than how we're thinking of it, and we have to totally reimagine it. So there's like two kind of moments that need to be addressed. One is whether we do actually have this moment of spark that happens when the choice is totally arbitrary and we have like a choice. I do believe that we have that free mm -hmm. will, kind of a toss of a coin where something gets determined. But what's interesting is the moment where we become aware of the free will choice, as in, uh, I ask you, you sit in a restaurant and I ask you, do you want the fish or the steak? There's this moment, like you have two options and now you're about to make a choice. What do you want? Steak, steak. for sure. You had a second now where you had kind of to look at all the options. I gave right. you only two and make a decision. So now, at some point, if I asked you, when did you make the choice? You would say, well, maybe as soon as I finished the sentence, maybe, I would, maybe you would say a, a fraction of a second afterwards. The question is, A, how far before did we know the answer to that? Also, did the, there, was there anything I could have said differently that would have made you say the fish? Mm. And most importantly, what's the gap between the moment you would tell me that's the moment I chose and the moment that you actually chose? And apparently there is a gap. Mm. And this gap is what we call the illusion of free will. The moment where you say, that's the moment, T, this is T0, this is when it happened. And I can look at your brain and say, you know what? Actually, here, we already knew that you're gonna choose. Or even, like, even if you wanna take it one first time, we can actually stimulate your brain and make you choose this thing. And I will tell you and I say, wow. who made the choice? And you say, I definitely make the choice myself. This was my decision. And I say, well, you know what? Here's me zapping your brain before making you say fish. Here's <laughs> what, me zapping your brain. What do you zap it with? Transcranial magnetic simulation? Yes. Okay. So this is not me, but there are people who yeah. now do so this. So what would you do? Can you really do the steak fish one? There's, a, 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 the only, demo of that, that I saw was one person basically having a little box and they have buttons and have to choose whether you want to press the left or the right button. Uh -huh. And people sit there and they press left, right, right, left, left, left for like 10 minutes. And then someone asked them, was it your choice? Which button to press at any point? And say, of course. And then you zoom out and you see a person sitting with a TMS, like this machine that looks at the brain and basically playing like a puppeteer. Left, Get right, right, left. Get the fuck out of here. That's real? That's real. And what's interesting isn't that you can do that. This is not surprising. We know that we can actually zap Whoa. your brain and make you move your head. What's surprising is that you would tell me it was my choice. Like you would, you would believe that it was your decision. You wouldn't question the oh, fact wow. that what you did was your decision. And this to me is the interesting part that we, we kind of have this way with our brain to always defend it. Mm. And always say, whatever I did, I wanted to do. Right. So if, if I made <laughs> this thing, this wasn't my choice. And now we know that it wasn't necessarily your choice, that things affected you, that things made you do what you did, and you will always claim that it was your decision. So we can actually show you that you're not really fully How in control. How do people respond when you show them? Funny, uh, they mostly try to defend free will. So they try to argue with me. And you know, I show them the video of me changing <laughs> things, and they say, no, no, no. So we have this experiment where we bring them to the lab, and we just tell them things. We say, okay, what do you wanna eat after the experiment? Where do you wanna sit here or there? We ask them to make decisions, and we don't really tell them anything. We just say, take decisions, like sit here or there. Do you want this pen or that pen? Do you want uh, the light on or off? And then we mm. ask them after the experiment, how many choices you made? The people who experienced us toying with their free will think that they made hundreds of choices. They made about 14. But they really wow. feel that, okay, I had so many choices, I controlled everything, this was my decision. They kind of try to grasp into the idea of free will and say, I had a lot of choices in my life and I made them. They become a little more religious. They become a little bit more uh, uh, ethical. A lot of things happen to you when you feel that what's in question is your identity. Mm. That is so interesting. And I've heard a lot of these studies and I have not heard where you're literally playing Congo drums on whether they do the right and left. I've seen the one where um, you know they're about to do it before they do. And so you turn the buttons on essentially to buzz them and tell them not to press, which is hilarious. Um, but I didn't know about that one. It's so interesting. So, okay, you're a guy with deep background in narrative. You teach a screenwriting course for God's sake. So. Help me understand how you know that you can manipulate the brain and yet you still believe in free will, but it sounds like you believe in free will in the way that it's tied to your own self-narrative. So here's the idea. I feel that uh, there's a lot of things that affect our decisions. The temperature in the room, the height of the chair, the uh, weight of the book we're holding, a lot of things. And this is studied by a lot of people in many, many ways that show time and again that you can actually change a person's behavior. And we can list those things so someone can take them and now have a kind of, you know, list of things that they can apply if they want to have better interactions with people, what temperature should the room be, what they should do. So there, we know that. We mm -hmm. know that thing. And at the same time, we still live life as if it's our decisions entirely. So we know that uh, I can trick you by 
you know, uh, making the price of the food 6.99 rather than 7 and you would think it's 6 not 7. That's like the simplest one in the book. Mm. And all of us know it and it still works. Take that to a larger scale, we know that there's hundreds of thousands of biases that affect our brain. And even if I tell you what they are, you will still work the same way. So free will is becoming interesting to me when we learn all of those things and we say, okay, then who am I kind of? What's then, what's, mm. who's, in, who's in charge? Who's the puppeteer in this example? And the reality is that there are, what we learn is that there are more than one puppeteer in our brain. There's many, many, and every day one, the guy wakes up. And so one day we're this guy, one day we're this guy, and they're kind of vying for dominance. They fight and they compete. They kind of make a decision together. They, they vote. And ultimately we protect the person who spoke last and we say, this is who I am. And to me, what's interesting is that we can now actually show all the characters. We can show them fighting. We can tell you that there's more people in your brain. And in doing so, we can actually allow you to really manifest different sides of yours. So you know maybe that you're making better choices in the morning and I make better choices in the evening. You might know that you're making better decisions when you're hungry and I'm when I'm full. When you're talking to your friends, when you're alone. So we can now profile your brain. So if somebody's watching this right now and they're thinking, okay, wait, do I make better decisions when I'm hungry or full, night, day? What, what are you looking for and what can they look for at home? So I would say what we do with, with a lot of people who are kind of in senior positions in companies that want to actually make decisions better, we have a protocol that's a little bit tedious, so it's not easy to do it, but I'll tell you what it is, and then you can think of ways to maybe try it yourself. So yeah. we have them basically walk for a week with a diary and make choices and just write them down. So tell us, like, uh, you know, I had this fish or the steak for lunch and I chose this and this is how I chose. And, and they also write whether they were happy or not with the choice. Now, this is done the way they would do it normally, but we also add one more thing. We put the EEG cap on their head. All day? For more than 24 hours. So they wow. walk with something that measures their brain activity. And there's a moment where we have to replace the batteries. There's a lot of like gaps there, but altogether right. we have them walk through life with both living life the way they do and reflect on their the choices, but also have us look at their brain. And what we do at the end of the three days, one week, as long as they would do that, it's kind of uncomfortable and embarrassing Weird. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, we ask them to kind of look at all the choices and tell us which ones were good, which ones were bad. And then we look at their brains and we see what was their brain looking like, what, what did it look like when uh, they made choices that they were happy with. And we sometimes see that there are things in their brain that are kind of repeated. So maybe they make choices more uh, using this part of the brain. That I'm, I'm trying to simplify it by looking at parts sure. of the brain that are more emotional rather than uh, uh, like rational. We see that they activate more parts of the brain that are buried deep inside that has to do with reflection rather than like thinking. So we kind of, and we tell them, you know, here's what we learned about you. You are better in this and that state. So that's one thing. So it's kind of not easy to apply because you still have to have this thing on your head. Right. So not everyone can do that, but at least people in senior positions who feel that, you know, their choices are critical come to us and they say, okay, help me. I want to know who I am better. Now, what about the, the study you did where you've got the cyclist on the bike, they're going hard, 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 hard. And you watch for certain brain states where you know, okay, they're going to quit. And then you use that information over time to get them to delay quitting farther and farther. How so so behind that lies uh, uh, the idea that the brain is kind of like a muscle. Mm. And specifically, there's a part of the brain that we really care about. It's the part that's doing self-control. So if you think about it in a simple way to look at it, is that uh, you start running, you go running. Uh, the first mile, your legs say, let's run. And the brain that controls them <laughs> says, let's run. And another part of it says, no problem at all. After one mile, your legs say, it's a little bit painful, but the parts of the other brain that controls them say, keep going. After 10 miles, the legs say, I want to quit. And the other parts <laughs> say, no, uh, keep going. And there's like a battle there. And at some point, you're going to break. Now, when you're going to break depends on a lot of things, your muscles. But it also uh, depends on this kind of control coming from the front of your brain mm. that overrides your experience, your pain. And if we can see this moment where you break, the moment where you stop, despite the fact that you can do a little more, mm. we can come back to you tomorrow and say, let's do the same thing you did yesterday. Have you run? Only this time when you get to the moment when we see that you're about to break, we're going to play a sound. We're going to tell you that we can see that you're about to break. And we ask you to just continue for one more minute at this moment that is beyond what you did yesterday. What, in that moment, how do you appeal to them? Is it like, come on, motherfucker, like you got this, or? That's basically, it's right, there's, there's a question in, in sports for a while. Why is it that people uh, do better when they play home game versus outside game? Like, mm. what, what is it about your mom being in the audience that makes you win the game? <laughs> like, we, we, like, in theory, they shouldn't matter. Like, throwing the basketball should be the same. But somehow right. we know that if your friends are there, 
if you're feeling better, we know that people do better when they're already kind of winning. There's a lot of things mm. that affect our brain. And what we try to understand right now is where is it in the brain? What is this part of the brain that gets better when, you're, like when your emotions are, are highlighted mm. or heightened? And now we're seeing it. That is so, this is life. Like what you're talking about right now, boys and girls at home, I'm telling you, there's a banality to being an entrepreneur. There is a willingness to suffer to being an entrepreneur, to being a great mom. Like whatever it is that you're trying to do, suffering is involved. And it literally like the, being able to extend your break point is what it's about. Mm -hmm. And when it's, I read- What I was gonna say is that we, we all, face those moments when the alarm buzzes at 6 a.m. We set the alarm at 10 p.m. and suddenly in the morning we're different people. Like we're not the person who wants to wake up anymore. And it's the same brain that set the alarm at 10 p.m. but now suddenly at 6 a.m. we're mm. not the same guy. This is the moment like that. We have to make a choice. When we're going running, when we're about to eat the cake, there's like a tasty cake and we're on a diet. And we say, oh, I shouldn't eat the cake, but there's a conflict. And we, now is the moment where those two parts of the brain come to life. And the more you know about yourself, the more you're aware of those situations, the better you can do in controlling them. And the more you know about yourself, you can do better in all of those tasks. And that's kind of the ultimate thing. That, that's why we're here. We're giving you the knowledge. And once you know, it doesn't work anymore. Once you know that 699 isn't seven, it's harder for you to work. So just knowing is enough for people to do better. To know that it's in your capacity to change. And that's what we want. Like, how does somebody become more self-aware? How do they begin to identify those things that are particular to them so that they can extend their breaking point or so that they can, you know, this. improve whatever? So, so all we need to do is we need to communicate science in tangible way so people would know all the options. I, I said that there's hundreds of thousands of options, but there are actually a couple of hundreds of biases that we humans have. I can give you examples in a second. Once you know them, they don't work anymore. So the job of scientists is to just translate the knowledge of the brain into words that can be then spoken to an audience who then lives by them. And that's it. So all we need to do is just do this. Speak to people and list the biases. Then it doesn't work anymore. Then, then at least when it happens, you become a little bit better in controlling that. That's all we need. It's pretty simple. Once you know, it doesn't work. So how about, I mean, let's use an example from your life. So. I love the story, by the way, of you're about to be published in Nature. It's your first big break in science. I mean, this is really gonna set up your career. And then someone wakes you up from a nap and you basically say, yeah, recording dreams is possible. You can't take it back. You're like, wait, wait, that's not quite what I meant. And it goes crazy. But the part that I love is, um, Christopher Nolan calls you up and says, hey, I just did this movie, Inception. You're now the dream recording guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to come with me and do a worldwide tour, which would be a huge break for you and just be, I'm sure, money and certainly notoriety. Um, and you had to think about it. <laughs> Even though you knew going means essentially reinforcing this opinion that I actually don't agree with, um, but turning it down means that I pass up that opportunity. What, what did you go through in the 24 hours before you gave the answer? So this is, so to give you the full story, I'm finishing my PhD. I just decide what I do next. Am I continuing in science? Do I go like back to being a hacker? This is like a moment of a fork in my life. Mm. And suddenly this comes this moment where the end of my five year PhD is getting a lot of attention, but all wrong. This, my career hinges on this thing. Then I have an, suddenly an option to actually own this thing and become this dream expert, even though it's based on a lie. Right. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to have enough uh, checks and balances that I didn't really <laughs> have to, to go far with that. So here's the interesting reflection that I have right now. So I knew it's impossible to look mm. at people's dreams and I knew that I kind of set it in a sleepy state and created this like amazing uh, story for people that scientists are now recording dreams. And the mistake was to leave this, to say, you know, I, it's not possible. I'm not gonna own this thing, even though the world cares about it. So if anything can be learned from this thing is that the world really wanted to have people record dreams because that's why it's such a big thing because people mm -hmm. cared about it. It was, in, dreams are interesting. And I went and I said, it's impossible and I wanna kill this story. This was the mistake. Interesting. Three years later, I'm sitting at home now 2013, and I got a call from BBC again. BBC were the first ones to kind of, you know, uh, let the mm. story go uh, away. 
And they call me again and they say, uh, Professor Surf, we want you to comment on dream recording and the possibility of doing that. And I say, guys, are you kidding me? We're done with that. This is not true. Like, let's not even begin going there. I said, no, no. We know that you cannot do that. But we want you to comment on the work of Professor Kamitani from Japan, who is doing it right now. So someone in Japan didn't know that it was impossible. He just didn't hear me going anywhere public and saying it's impossible. So he just did it. So three years after I said it was impossible, someone did it. And two years after that, I joined. So now half the thing we do in my lab is actually looking at people's dreams. Wow. So we, the mistake I made wasn't to say that something is possible when it was not. It was to say that something was impossible before I knew that. Because I think that science is all about going to those dark places and trying wow. to find what's impossible. My mistake was to say it was impossible before I was sure about that. So I should have said, we don't know yet, we didn't do it yet, but we should investigate. I was quick to say, I didn't do it, it's impossible. So I delayed things by three years. Five years after, I'm doing it right now. Dude, can I just shake your hand? I fucking love that so much. Like that's, like most people cannot look at something like that and say the mistake that I made was actually in the opposite direction and I should have been bolder. I should have made a wiser proclamation. And then to, to actually join the team, that's so cool. Dreams is something that I was told not to study. Now that's what I do in my lab every day. Now I'm never saying that. something is impossible before I'm certain that it's impossible. Wow, I love that. I'd love it even more if you, if you would go so far as to say nothing is truly impossible. Then you'd really have so, me. I'll, I'll go with that. So the, you, like you, you mentioned that I teach screenwriter and I, mm. and screenwriting and I, and I work with TV. The reason I do that is because I feel that the best ideas for my research come from those hours with the kids who write plays, with the fellows at the American Film Institute who write science fiction, from movies that, that, that inspired me. Like, the Matrix. Mm. You, you sure. mentioned that. Like this has inspired us. We are kids of 1999. What happened then affected us. Mm. Star Trek affected my dad's generation. The best paper that I ever written has a thousand of citation. The episode of Limitless that I worked on last week and you know came out has five million people watching it. And those are the kids who are gonna be me in 20 years. And if they think, oh, this is maybe possible, they're gonna do that. And you ask me how to change behavior, this is how, to know what the possibilities are. For instance, I'm relatively bright and educated and until about 18 months ago, I, I just thought you make as much US dollar as you can, mm -hmm. you put it under your mattress and you're fine. Mm -hmm. And then I was introduced to the idea of inflation and how even 2% becomes problematic really fast, 7% becomes terrifying, yes. and 15% you're devastated in less right. than a decade. Yes. And I was like, what? So that put me on this mad scramble. As somebody who never wanted to learn about investing, I was yes. like, I'm good at making money. I have no interest in learning about finance or investing. And every time I would speak to my money manager, I was like, this is dumb. I don't, I don't want to learn about calls and puts yeah, and options. Yeah, yeah. It's so complicated. So given how complicated it is, I just want to trust the government. So yes. I would choose it out of laziness and terror. Yes. So we're all prone to seek out cognitive expedience. And I would say even the dollar itself, you don't want dollars per se. You don't want a definite amount of dollars. You want purchasing power. But I don't realize it. You're right. Yes. But I don't realize it. That's right. As a matter of cognitive expedience, you think in terms of dollars and said, and this is where you get deeper into what is money. Money is also a psychotechnology. It's like literacy or numeracy. It's a software implementation we put into our brain. We use it to communicate, negotiate, plan. I mean, how many times a day do you think in dollars? It's something that's deeply embedded in our cognitive machinery. Um, and that gets into my argument later about why central banking is kind of a computer <laughs> virus on the human brain. But I think what would be an appropriate avenue here is to think, OK, you've been pursuing dollars your whole life. What you're actually pursuing is what those dollars can get you. That's what money is, right? Money is the most exchangeable good. You can think of it as a call option on anything the market can produce. So any good, any service, any knowledge, human time, anything people can do, any service anyone can render for you, money is a call option on that. And that's why it's the most valuable or apex good in a marketplace. So what it ultimately means is that money is the most important form of property. So what we're all really after, all of our businesses, our lifestyles, our governments, these are property strategies, if you will. These are ways to 
reach consensus on property, to distribute property in an equitable way, in a way that we all determine to be um, fair, right? Fair and equitable. So it will probably help here to, we're, we're setting up a lot of rabbit holes. We'll go into the property rabbit hole first. We typically think property is the house, the car, the stock, whatever. That's not what property is. Property is a relationship. It's an exclusively acknowledged relationship between the owner and the asset, right? The fact that you own this house and no one else can come into it. If they did, you have recourse to uh, the government, right? The apparatus of compulsion and coercion. You can call the police force and say, hey, this guy is violating my property. Please remove him. That is the foundation of civilization. When we can go and take our most personal form of property, which is ourselves, right? And this is something we're talking offline, self-ownership. Mm. This is the foundational axiom on which all of this libertarian capitalistic philosophy is based. Um, you own yourself. Only you can move your arm. Only you can move your leg, right? You can't even sell that property. You can't trade away your consciousness or your willpower to anyone else. You own it and it's inalienable, cannot be traded away. What you choose to do with that self-ownership, you go out into the world and you voluntarily add value to something, right? You plant a garden, you build a business, uh, or you trade the fruits of your labor with other self-owned people. That's how we create wealth, right? That's what enables us to focus, specialize, and create wealth. So the basis of civilization is that relationship between the owner and their asset, which we call property. Money is just a reflection of the wealth in the world, right? The property that we have created through this capitalistic process. When you give one organization, right? This is all based on free market dynamics, but when you give one organization legal monopoly privileges, which is what the central bank is, to now monopolize money and control its issuance, they have a mechanism to violate the property rights of all other economic actors that are using dollars, that are denominating assets in dollars. So this is something that's so fundamental that it, it contradicts the premise of self-ownership when we give power away to a single institution that can arbitrarily, at a political whim, uh, choose to violate the relationships of all economic actors using that money. So. That's a bit of the what is property rabbit hole. We could go into gold next. Well, or first, let's go back to what you said, that nobody would voluntarily choose a fiat currency. Uh -huh. And the reasoning behind that is, OK, you have a portion of the total, whatever that yes. portion is. So the number of dollars that you have represents a dollar of the uh, a percentage of the total. If they can change the total at any time, yes. they can dilute you and yes. so your perception is that the value of your house is going up but right. the reality is the value the buying power of the dollar is going down that's correct and so it creates a the the mental equivalent of an optical illusion yes so you think oh my god that's i'm right. winning this is amazing yes uh but in reality you have opted into a system where human beings yeah like you said arbitrarily make a decision as to whether or not they're going to inflate that by mm -hmm. just and this was, I, I am embarrassed by how recently I thought this. I actually asked somebody, and this is, I think, less than a year ago. I said, where do they take the bags of money that they're printing? Like, whose doorstep mm -hmm. are they dropping them off at? And of course, the, the answer is it's a database and it's just a data That's entry. Right. But even that, whose data entry are they changing? You're right. The, this is an important point, actually. Uh, the U.S. dollar is a one node database it's on an SQL server at the Federal Reserve. So it's the list of who owns what dollars. And there's one group of individuals that update it for everyone else arbitrarily. Um, and to your, your earlier point uh, about inflation, I think it's best to think about this as like a cap table, right? When you own a business and you have shares in a business that you're buying and selling, you wouldn't arbitrarily give one group the ability to just issue new shares whenever they want and dilute everyone else. That would clearly be asymmetric and unfair to, to the shareholders. Yet that's exactly the model we have in money. Exactly. All right. That you can think it's an, another way to think about money, maybe, is it it's a share in the capital stock of the world, right? My share of the US dollar supply 
gives me a fraction of whatever U.S. dollars can buy. It's if, again, if money is a reflection of the total capital pool or the total savings, um, that's what it effectively represents in its purchasing power. But when one group can just twist the rules to favor themselves and disfavor everyone else, you have a disequilibrated structure or an asymmetric monopolized structure. Um, so hopefully that explains inflation and property a little bit. It does. Um, putting a real fine point on why it's theft, though, because it theft implies it implies ill intent. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's what you intend. In fact, let's start there. Do you intend that that ill intent is afoot? Uh, I would say it's more the arbitrariness. Right. I, I don't necessarily want to dig into the intent so much as mechanically what happens. It's an arbitrary redistribution of wealth or property from one group to another. So they're diluting the property rights of dollar holders. Anyone depending on the dollar to store its value is being victimized. And those getting access to the freshly produced or printed money first are the victimizers. They're the ones actually extracting wealth from that group. And this is uh, especially abhorrent because if you think who depends on the dollar to store its value the most, the poor. Those living on fixed income, pensioners, retirees, right? People living paycheck to paycheck. These are the people being stolen from. So I'm not going to make a claim about intent. There's a lot of arguments about, oh, no, central banking. They don't mean to be doing what they're doing. They think they're doing what's in everyone's best interest. Fine. I'll accept the argument. But mechanically, those depending on the dollar are being robbed by central banks and those that receive the newly printed money first. And who receives the newly printed money and how is that decided? And printed again is by changing numbers in a database. Yes, so uh, a lot of the beneficiaries are asset holders, right? Um, Name some assets. Real estate, stocks. How, so I own both of those. How do I benefit? Because I'm terrified of inflation. Right. So why am I not excited? Because when money, the store value function of money is compromised, which is what's happening when when we inflict inflation, that the dollar's not holding its value over time. People, market actors are smart, right? They're going to move into a reliably scarce asset. The most predominant store value in the world today are stocks, frankly. So stocks, real estate, all these things that are reliably scarce in an inflationary environment become store value assets. So People that hold those assets as a larger percentage of their total net worth will benefit at the expense of those relying on dollars to hold their value. Because what database entry is changed in that scenario? It's not like they gave me more money for owning those. Right. But your home will appreciate. Right. And it's not based on supply and demand so much as it is based on central bank policy. So they've if you think about more dollars chasing the same amount of stuff, it's kind of the simple way to think about it. This implies higher home prices. And it's not a consequence of supply and demand in the marketplace per se. It's just that diminished unit of economic perception. As the part dollar. of the quote unquote printing of money, is the government buying like um, corporate bonds and things like yes. that? Yes. It's because that's how they dollar. actually get it into the system, right? They go and buy a bunch of things, whether it's making sure that the California government doesn't default on their uh, bonds and things like yes. that. Um, and then they actually buy things off of companies, right? That's right. And this is a very I like to say central banking and the fiat currency complex is as clear as mud and twice as dirty. Nice. So it's very uh, confounding, to say the least. But. Um, essentially, the government is issuing new debt, right, which the Federal Reserve is buying. So they're injecting dollars into the economy uh, that way. It's become more exotic recently where the Fed's actually spinning up special purpose vehicles to buy corporate debt directly. Um, I think equities as well. And so what's happening is there's this confiscation of wealth taking place and then the proceeds are being doled out arbitrarily. So you could think of the the Fed or um, government beneficiaries of Fed policy as picking winners and losers. So this is antithetical to capitalism, right? Which capitalism is much more Darwinian, right? Survival of the fittest. If the business is producing profits and satisfying wants for people, then people will pay for it voluntarily and that business will grow. If the business is 
unsatisfactory, it's not delivering uh, good goods or services to people, people will abstain from doing business with that entity and it will shrink and fail. And when that business fails, its capital will be reassimilated into the marketplace and put to higher and best use. That's what capitalism does. But when you have this arbitrary avenue of confiscation and, and wealth redistribution, it, it stymies that evolutionary impulse that capitalism gives us. So you end up with zombie companies, right? And it's funny that they use that term zombie, um, which is, I had a good conversation with a guy about this, how this has entered the modern mythology or lexicon. Uh, interestingly, right after 1971, which is when we went off the gold standard, the term zombie became much more widely used. But zombie companies are that. They're loss producing enterprises. They're not satisfying anyone's wants, but they're kept on life support by central bank policy. So we have central bankers printing money to uh, harvest the productive surplus of the economy stealing from the productive economy and then doling it out to these certain entities that are producing losses and keeping them alive. So it's um, very polluting in that way, if you will. It's, 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 it's toxifying to the Darwinian process. And I think that's why it degrades uh, everything that's downstream from economics, like politics and culture, et cetera. All right. I want to walk through one thread that I, all of this is me taking liberally from you. So mm -hmm. tell me where Please. I go astray here. Um, but this was a chain of events that I was like, oh, my God, I now actually understand what's going on. And this is terrifying. So you've got um, World War Two happens mm -hmm. and you've got people invading countries and raiding their gold stores because mm -hmm. why would you invade if you're not going to get something if That's you can't right. steal something these are your words so you invade a country you steal their gold so people are like fuck i don't want to get invaded so they started or if i do i don't want them to be able to steal my gold so they started sending gold to the u.s u.s ends up storing all this gold for people has a massive amount of gold mm -hmm. and gold historically basically money as we think of it the the tangible dollars and bills mm -hmm. You would store gold in a protected warehouse somewhere and they would give you a That's paper right. that represented the amount of gold. So people being savvy started trading that because it's as good as gold because you right. could go and cash it in. So now the U.S. post-World War II has all this gold coming in. And we then after World War II have a, the Bretton Woods mm -hmm. uh, convention. I'm not sure what it was yeah. exactly. But they say, hey, we've got all this gold now. We're going to make the dollar, the um, central reserve currency, mm -hmm. global reserve currency, excuse me. And but it's all backed by all this gold that we have. So, hey, we're good. But in yeah. 1971, for reasons that you will have to explain, uh, Nixon decided to take us off of the gold standard. So previously to that, if you had a dollar, you could actually go redeem it for gold. Yes. Now, you couldn't, and it was fiat, it was by decree. I say that this dollar has value and therefore it has value. Uh, the problem is that's married to something that happened at some point in the early 1900s that you will have to explain, the beast from Jekyll Island, where uh, we decided from Jekyll Island. Uh, yeah. to create a central bank, which isn't owned by the government, right? Correct. Which I still can't believe is true. The yeah. Federal Reserve yeah. is not the federal government. It's not government. federal and it has no reserves. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like this is where I'm like, what? language matters. Well yeah. played. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good way to get me think that this is a government. All right. So we now break with the gold standard. And yeah. so it's we can literally print money. So as me, the ignorant guy that spent his whole life trying to make money, knows nothing about investing. I make the money. I think I am safe actually putting it under mm -hmm. my bed only to realize that there's actually somebody that has the ability to go print or go burr, right? And they, yes. they can press a button and it just makes more money. And therefore, with more money floating around, you've got more people competing to buy that loaf of bread or whatever. Yeah. So the cost goes up, as one yeah. would naturally expect. And so now, even though I theoretically have my assets are going up and yay, I have more money, but I... I either have the same buying power, so it's just an illusion, or I actually have less buying power and it's right. actually devastating. And so now we get into this crazy making loop of it seems like I should be getting ahead, but I'm not getting ahead. I think of inflation as being a natural act, but really in the background are people making these decisions and, and we will grant them that they are being kind. Yeah. They're trying to do something nice. They're trying to level out volatility, if I had to guess is actually yeah. their motivation. Uh, but they level out that volatility by um, creating debt cycles and devaluing the currency, which 
you are saying mechanistically it just isn't different than theft. Um, but when people think of redistribution of wealth as a good thing, mm -hmm. is that just another crazy making thing? Or are people right to think that, no, this is good. We should be redistributing the wealth. Well, that's a good long question. Um, <laughs> I would start Certainly with a this. long question. Yeah. So let's do this. Wealth redistribution, first of all, no one ever thinks it's a good thing when they're the target. No one ever, no one ever wants to be redistributed from. No one ever voluntarily gets redistributed from. That would be giving up value or wealth or capital for nothing in exchange. I don't think anyone, I don't say no one ever, but typically no one ever will enter that um, agreement, let's say. So maybe we'll track this arc. We'll do what is gold? How did we get gold? Why and how central banking was introduced? And then we'll get into um, really what's happened post 1971. So, and I love this question, by the way, what is money, right? This is the name of the show. And this is the, I think the key to incepting these ideas into people, or at least getting people to question their socioeconomic reality such that they can peel back the layers of this onion and see through some of these euphemisms we've been getting to, or we've been given. And one definition of money, this is the Austrian economic definition, is that it's a universal medium of exchange. So again, capitalism is built on free exchange. It's built on voluntary action, right? Self-ownership, you go out into the world, create things of value, you trade them with other cell-owned people. The result is we create more output per unit of input. We become more efficient acting in concert than we do acting in isolation. This is the division of labor. This is the reason wealth and riches exist because we specialize and we trade with one another. In that process, something necessarily becomes most exchangeable or most tradable, right? By definition, if we're all trading with one another, there's gonna be a single asset of that uh, flurry of trading activity that is the most liquid asset, the most tradable or exchangeable asset. That is money. That's how money emerges in the marketplace. It is not a government creation, it has nothing to do with government other than the fact that they monopolize it and try to control it to control people. Um, and when you look at money from that first principle standpoint, and this is from the Austrian school, there's a deep, long literature on this, you'll see that money needs to exhibit five key properties. And this is an important point. We typically think that we want the thing, right? We want the table, we want the car, whatever. But we don't. We want the services the thing renders to us. So you could think almost in the world of economics, there are no such thing as goods, if you will. I know there are goods, I know there's tables, I know there's cars, but what we are after is what services those goods provide to us. So when we look at money, the five properties that market actors voluntarily favor, you could also think of as the five services we seek from money are divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. So I'll walk through each one of these. Money needs to be divisible, pretty obvious. You wanna transact at different scales. You wanna buy coffee in the same day that you go and buy a house, right? So you'd like to be able to give someone a coin or send someone a wire for 10 million bucks to buy a house. Pretty obvious. Um, money needs to be durable in that it's not going to corrode over time. If you put a bunch of gold in a safe, it's not gonna decompose, right? The half-life on gold is way longer than uh, matters to any of us. If you put a bunch of oranges in the safe and you were using that as money, that's gonna rot pretty quickly. So clearly durability matters. Money needs to be recognizable which means that each trading party can verify its authenticity. So at every transaction, and I'm handing you dollars, you can certify either with that little pin they mark on dollars to make sure it's uh, a legitimate you know, US Federal Reserve issued dollar, or if it was gold back in the day, they had different techniques for assaying uh, the gold's authenticity, making sure it wasn't lead plated with gold. Uh, in fact, the name Sound Money which you've probably heard in, in your explorations of the rabbit hole, 
that referred to the sound a gold coin made when dropped a certain way. So you could verify its authenticity by the sound it would create. Um, and this is another reason we introduced coinage and currency, because to verify money at every transaction is a very significant transaction cost. Transaction costs are dissipative to trade, right? If we want to increase trade and increase wealth, we want to reduce transaction costs. So by abstracting into currency or putting it in a warehouse and trusting the warehouse custodian, we can now trade much more quickly and more efficiently. So that, I mean, that's that's one aspect of money that coinage and currency helped was recognizability. Money also needs to be portable. Pretty obvious. You want to be able to move it across space, right? If I'm buying something in another city, I need to get my gold or dollars to the other city to give it to the recipient. Finally, and most importantly, money has to be scarce. And now we typically think scarce is purely a supply side function. That's not what scarcity means. Scarcity occurs when demand outstrips supply. So when there is more appetite for the thing than there is a supply of the thing. Okay, so oxygen, pretty important for human life. There's no price on it. Why? Not scarce. It's not scarce. The supply way outstrips the demand, right? Um, something like diamonds, not that important to human existence, yet it has a huge price because the demand way outstrips the supply. The unique thing about scarcity and money is that money is always scarce because it's a call option on everything, all the capital, all the savings humans can produce. The heart of man is never satisfied. We always want more. Therefore, money is always scarce by definition. So what market actors tend to favor is the money that has the most inelastic supply. So this means the supply that is least subject to change uh, by the willpower of others. That is what market actors will zero in on. And here, there's another a number of ways to think about this. Um, time, energy, second law of thermodynamics. We cannot create nor destroy energy, right? We're sacrificing time and energy to earn money. You would naturally want the thing you're sacrificing this absolutely scarce time and energy for to be similarly absolutely scarce. That would be the ideal money, right? Something that can't be created or destroyed. Um, with money, to gloss over a little bit of history, monetary metals, best satisfied, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability. Those are just, and we've tried a lot of experiments. We've had seashells, we've had glass beads, we've had cattle, we've, we've used all kinds of things as money, right? Natural market processes determined that monetary metals were the most satisfactory across the first four properties or services that money can render to us. Of the monetary metals, gold was the most scarce, meaning specifically its supply was the least vulnerable to change. No matter how much effort, time, energy we poured into producing gold, its supply increased the slowest and the most predictably. So this gave us a medium into which we could store economic value and we would know with relative certainty that it would only change by about 2% year over year. So this gave gold the store value function we traditionally associate with it. Um, that's great, right? Gold is great. Gold is good money. It's been good money, 5,000 years, uh, served a lot of purposes, but the big hang up with gold is lack of portability. Right. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You want to be able to move it across space, obviously, but gold's heavy. It's physical, right? It's very expensive to secure. Um, it actually, in one way, it's beneficial and that you can store a lot of economic value in a small area and sort of uh, amortize the security costs around it. But when you need to move it, that's when there's a lot of risk involved. And this was the impetus for introducing what you alluded to earlier were the warehousing businesses. So a private enterprise, a free market function came to be where a warehouse would take custody of the gold, give you the warehouse receipt, you can go and transact it, it's as good as gold, right? You have a call option on gold effectively. This was introduced to augment the portability of gold. 
Well, those warehouses became banks. Those banks became central banks. And this is all, again, I'm not laying out a nefarious scheme here. This is the economics, the economies of scale associated with gold. It is more efficient to centralize custody of this heavy, bulky metal and issue abstractions in it. It's more efficient to transact in that model than it is with physical gold. So that's what drives this process. The problem is you now have to trust the custodian. You've introduced what we call counterparty risk. There's a counterparty to that trade. I can trade this paper with everyone and it's as good as gold until I go to redeem the gold from the warehouse and there's the gold's not there or they won't redeem it or a fraction of what this paper represents is available. Um, so that is kind of the history of gold into central banking. And I guess the history of central banking is quite interesting. Um, I would say that, you know, maybe this is an important point too, that people were all seeking something for nothing. I think this is kind of unavoidable. This is the entrepreneurial path, right? You've got a problem, you've got an itch, you want to scratch that itch or solve that problem with less effort, right? The, the, the really successful entrepreneur is almost brilliantly lazy, right? He's identifying a problem and finding the quicker way, a better way to solve it. When he makes that discovery, he can now sell that product or that service or that method, whatever it is, into the marketplace. And because everyone wants something for nothing, they will reward him. Right. This is the entrepreneurial process. So that's great. We all want something for nothing and it's a, a valid, noble pursuit. The problem, I think, is when we cross that line of self-ownership or of morality and we start seeking something for nothing from others. Right. Someone else has planted the garden. Someone else has built the business. Someone else has mined the gold. And instead of me performing the work to create that value or earn that value, I figured that I can just go out and co-opt or coerce or take that property or that asset from that person. That's a path for me to get something for nothing. But it's the immoral path, right? So I see this as kind of like the driving force in most human action. We're trying to get something for nothing, but there's a line that can be crossed. And we talked earlier about self-ownership. I think that's the line. When you violate the self-ownership of someone else, that's a problem. Central banking sort of came about as this natural institution to augment the technological limitations of gold. It wasn't portable, right? But when you put that much power, you concentrate that much power into one institution, it becomes noxious. It becomes corrupting. It becomes uh, irresistible for some people of lower scruples anywhere in the world to seek that seat of power. And this is what I think has really started to deteriorate the monetary system. And if you look at the history of central banking, it's a lot of leveraging one another, right? You, you know, you talked about a lot of the gold ending up in the United States. This is also pre-World War II. A lot of it has to do with the balance of payments among countries, which are just inflows and outflows of capital. But particularly when things got hot in Europe, a lot of gold started coming into the U.S., and again, with when we, with that much power or money in one place, we became the world superpower. And so we stepped on to the, the theater of war at the end of World War II, and we declared ourselves victorious, rightfully or wrongfully so. You can make your own judgments about that. And then we rewrote the rules of global banking to favor the United States, where the dollar is pegged to gold. All of the currencies are pegged to the dollar. So what this gave the United States is the infamous exorbitant privilege, as has been called, to be able to print money. We could send these paper certificates out into the world and have them send us goods and services in exchange. Ad infinitum, right? Until the system breaks down. Countries had the option to call our bluff, though. They could accept these dollars, but they could redeem them for gold if they thought we're being irresponsible with, with the monetary policy for printing too much money. Well, 
country started calling our bluff after 1944. Uh, we had this huge economic boom. And then again, glossing over some history, I think it was Germany that tried to repatriate some gold. So they tried to redeem dollars for gold. And then we had the infamous 1971 Nixon shock that said no more gold redemptions. And from that point on, and it was said to be a temporary measure, as governments so often and infamously say, who was it that said that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government solution? <laughs> Here we are exactly 50 years later in 2021, um, deep into this global fiat currency experiment led by the United States. Um, and things have really come off the hinges. I've, I've point people on this topic to this website, WTF happened in 1971.com. This is not just economic, right? This is, it's socioeconomic. There's, you know, obesity rates have spiked, um, drug addiction, suicide, uh, clearly indebtedness, right? When, when You think this is tied to coming off the gold standard? As the Austrians wrote a long time ago, the monetary standard and the moral standard are inexorably linked. That, and this gets into, back into property and time preference. Um, when money's losing its value over time, we're all incentivized to be more short-term thinking. This is a de-civilizing force. And I think it is at, I don't want to say it's the sole cause for a lot of the cultural malaise we see in the world today, but I think it's a significant contributor. If you enjoyed this episode, check out this deep conversation with Donald Hoffman about reality and consciousness. What we are are avatars of the one. The one awareness is exploring all of its possibilities through different avatars. So somehow there is this field of awareness 